and we will see how this goes. I'm trying a couple of trying something else new to see if I cannot uh, have issues with my um, camera lagging. Uh, I think I figured out what the problem was and hopefully try to avoid that. All right, let me turn this on. My output's not changed with. Oh, the There we go. Sometimes, sometimes. All right, so this is, I believe, from what I could tell, please say so if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is where we stopped. Um, looking around the cameras, I know Savannah's having issues. Hey, Savannah, maybe you didn't, um, set up your or approved that camera uh permissions um for the computer so the computer can't access it but uh i don't know i'm sure you guys know what you're doing down there um i don't see any outsider um quarantine sick people so hopefully that means everybody's back in the classroom but also just kind of looks like a lot of classes are rather empty um today so um y'all need to be calling your friends or whatever i know a few people are running late from work but um but anywho um all right um so types of medication responses i believe this is where we left off last week so i think we should be good here um what am i looking for there we go. All right, so what this is talking about is how we're going to have various types of medication response due, due to the type of medication we use. Now, when we use a different medication, hey, we got Savannah, I can see you now. Um, <clears throat> when we we're going to select our medication based on the patient's condition. So an example of this would be uh, some of us have the opportunity to use both Zofran or Phenagrin. Uh, Phenagrin is the more traditional medication. It's been around for a really long time. Uh, it does have a lot of side effects, um, but it's very effective. Zofran, much newer medication, a lot less side effects. Some argue is not as effective. Uh, my personal experience has been that if my patient is uh, currently vomiting, you know, actively vomiting and has been actively vomiting for a minute, then Zofran's probably not going to do much good for them. But if the patient has um, not vomited yet, they're feeling nauseated and such, or maybe they vomited, but it was a while ago the Zofran tends to be more effective. So I'll go with the Zofran when they're like, eh, maybe vomited, but I'll go with the Phenagrin when I know their condition is much more severe uh, or they're actively vomiting. Another example would be if somebody's like, oh, I think I got food poisoning or I just don't feel good. So yeah, okay, you're gonna get some Zofran, uh, but they have uh, vertigo or Meniere's disease, something along those lines then I'm going to go with the fenugreek because it's going to be more effective. So I'll expect a more potent response. But with that response comes a lot of side effects. Um, some of the side effects of fenugreek are you're tired. It can put you slap to sleep. Another issue is the medication itself can be very irritating to the tissue. So whether it was given intramuscularly or IV, it can cause irritation, burning sensation and such. So you should uh, dilute the medication when you administer it um, in, in order to avoid that. Um, dilution tends to vary as to how you want to do it. Some people will dilute using a... Um, like a 10cc, 12cc syringe, fill it up with saline, draw the meds into that, 
that's dilute and that is an effective way to dilute it another way would be to mix it in like a 100 bag and give it as a uh infusion so more like a rapid drip so all right um where was i i'm sorry all right so here you go um what it's talking about with a repeat dosing when we're giving medications sometimes one dose is all it takes we give a dose brings it up to therapeutic levels the effect happens and takes place an example of this could be the use of like decadron or solumedrol for an inflammatory response um, generally for us that's a one and done now it's going to take a while and that's going to be in their system for quite a long time um but a case of requiring repeat dosing would be like the use of uh nitroglycerin during a uh, uh, STEMI uh, heart, a heart attack event where the patient has to be redosed every three to five minutes in order to maintain that therapeutic level in their system. Um, I, I mentioned Decadron or uh, Solumedrol, but another example would be aspirin. We're going to give one dose of aspirin. It causes the therapeutic effect. It creates a permanent bond with the uh, platelets that are in the uh, bloodstream at that moment. Uh, reducing the clotting event and problem solved. So, um, and only one dose is necessary. Now, um, sometimes we have to give multiple doses so that we can get to the total dose, the cumulative desired dose, but not get there too quickly. So we have to increase, increase, increase to get a uh, get to that total desired effect um now not all effects not all responses to our medication administration are going to be positive occasionally we'll have patients who's going to have a negative response uh, or a response that is not desired now these are any it's an adverse effect anytime it was a not desired effect but that doesn't always mean that the patient is um having an allergic reaction or that we have to stop or do anything like that or you know or change it sometimes we acknowledge that effect uh, an example of this would be again aspirin i know it seems like a very benign medication but it's one we use quite a bit and it's very effective for what we do but a side effect of aspirin administration could be gastrointestinal distress um generally speaking we see that with the um patients who are like oh i can't take that medication because it gives my stomach issues or whatever um okay well a little bit of stomach pain is probably a lot better than a heart attack so um what we're going to do is give them the medication we're going to give them the aspirin we're going to say well you can deal with that another example of an adverse effect would be the use of nitroglycerin during a uh mi a STEMI again if you give the um, nitroglycerin, it lowers the blood pressure. It does so by dilating the capillaries in the body. So side effect is all the capillaries dilate. That includes the capillaries in the brain. You dilate capillaries in the brain, you're going to increase blood flow in the brain. You're increasing the volume in the brain. Now, depending on the patient's fluid hydration yet and multiple other factors, that may be enough additional fluid in the brain to cause uh, a headache. And so a very common side effect of nitroglycerin is a headache. Again, I think a head, mild headache is a lot better option than having a heart attack. We, we know that this is an adverse, of, excuse me, this is an adverse effect, but we know it's an adverse effect that we're willing to tolerate because we know the cause. We, we know the origin of the headache. We know the patho behind it. It's a dilation of blood vessels. It's an increase of blood flow in the brain. It's a temporary event. This isn't like an increasing of blood pressure resulting in a, um, a stroke. This isn't uh, causing vasoconstriction and resulting in um, decreased oxygen flow to the brain or something along those lines. So there's a lot of... Um, 
other adverse effects that we may not want to have or we, we, we try to avoid. But in some cases, we accept the adverse effect and move on. Now, this doesn't mean that the patient has to suffer if they don't want to. They have autonomy. They have rights. So we need to explain to them, hey, so we're going to give you nitro. One of the side effects might be a headache. You okay with that? No, I'm not okay with headache. Okay, so you would rather have a STEMI, just letting you know that a STEMI can kill you, very likely. You'd rather have that than the headache caused by the nitro. Not pressuring you, I just need you to understand your risks. You don't take the medication, this is the risk. You take the medication, this is the risk and the reward. It's called informed consent. So we have to make certain that we establish that with our patients. And the when dealing with adverse effects. The patient can say, nope, don't want that effect, don't want to have to put up with that, don't want to risk that, I'll, I'll go with what I have. If it's my time, it's my time. Whatever their reason is, we have to respect that. They can say, yeah, no. Uh, an interesting one that I saw one time, I'm still to this day not uh, convinced that it's not what they were saying, but patient told me that she was allergic to all pain meds and um, including and nausea meds, including Zofran, and that they would cause restless leg syndrome. But surprisingly, shockingly, the only way to treat her pain or her nausea or even her restless leg syndrome when it started was with fenugrin and Dilaudid combined. And I'm like... Really? Really? Now, I made a mistake. I'm going to admit it. I asked her about her allergies. She said she was allergic to fener uh, to Zofran. I said, uh, she said that she um, started, we started an IV. Remember that? I can't even remember what her actual complaint was at this point. But we started an IV for care, for normal care. And she started feeling nauseated. Oh, I always get nauseated after I have an IV. Like, okay, all right, fine. I'll get some Zofran. Pull those Zofran up. Go and shoot. Boom, boom. All right, there you go. That's some Zofran. Oh, I was allergic to Zofran. You just asked me that. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Yeah, I did. Oh, my God. I, did. I just asked you. You said you were allergic to Zofran. And I just gave it to you. And crap. What am I going to do now? Um, okay, what was your aller allergy? What, what happens? Oh, I get restless leg syndrome. I'm like, what? That that what? That's not a that's not a known allergic reaction. Like I swear to God, I searched every page I could find on the internet afterwards. I'm like, yeah, no documentation anywhere of restless leg syndrome being an allergic reaction symptom to Zofran. But whatever. That's what the patient said, and at the moment I didn't know that. I'm like, oh crap. So I gave the um patient some um Diphenhydramine, some Benadryl, and stuff like this. She's like, "Oh, that won't work. That's not going to help. It's it's not it's not going to make any difference. All I have to have is fenugreek and Dilaudid." And I'm like, "Really, really?" So yeah, sometimes we have to think about that. Now, other times these adverse reactions will. Um, so in her case, she was making it very severe. She was like hollering in pain. Oh, my leg is cramping. Okay. Uh, like, oh, this was really weird. But other times, you'll get what's called like an idiosyncratic reaction. This is when the response, and that, you know, that could be what the case was with this patient, the Zofran, causing it to idiosyncratic. But another example would be like, let's say, um, I give nitro with the intention of lowering a patient's blood pressure, um, with the expectation that the blood pressure will lower with the intention of treating their chest pain and their blood pressure goes up and so does their chest pain. And it's like, okay, that wasn't supposed to happen. How How is that? What What is up with this? That would be an example of the um, idiosyncratic reaction, a reaction that was completely different. Now, if it's completely opposite, so like you expect them to calm down and they get excited. That's called paradoxical. You know, it's the paradoxical response. It's the opposite direction, but it's still an idiosyncratic. It is an unexpected, unique reaction to that person that is not what you normally would expect. 
Um, for example, I gave a, I would get no, I haven't had this issue, but an example of this would be let's give a person some fenugrin or some zofran for nausea to prevent vomiting. I give it to them, and all of a sudden they start vomiting violently. That's idiosyncratic. But it's also paradoxical. It's like, no, this is supposed to stop vomiting, and now it's making you vomit. Oh, another interesting example, one you're going to want to watch out for, is there are patients out there who are very sensitive to different types of benzos. And sh this is not fake. Strangely enough, they may be sensitive to Versed, but not Ativan, or more likely, and much more commonly, they're sensitive to Ativan, but not Versed or Valium. And so if you have a excited delirium, not necessarily excited delirium, but let's say you have a psychiatric patient who is in need of sedation, you need to calm this person down. So you decide to give them some Ativan. We're gonna give them like half a milligram, milligram Ativan, calm them down. Okay, cool. There are patients who will turn straight into the Hulk. Like they, they will, it's like Jekyll and Hyde. They, you thought they were crazy. Well, now they're crazy. And it's because of that paradoxical opposite reaction um, as a result of the Ativan. So something to keep in mind. Can you know that beforehand? Not necessarily, but if family's like, oh yeah, they do this, we, we can't do that med. Always ask those kind of questions. See, should we or should we not uh, give them this med? Uh, have they ever had this med before? What's it like when they have this med? That kind of a thing. All right, so therapeutic index. Um, I started talking about this the other day. I made the therapeutic window. Um, I, I demonstrated how, uh, and I'm going to sketch it up real quick here on the pad and um, then you'll be able to see it. So, of course, of course. Sometimes, I swear to God. I swear. <clears throat> All right, let's see if this works now. All right, so got it here for you. Let me show you, flip to this. Um, there you go. Yeah, it's crude, I'm sorry. All right, so on this, what I've drawn is a, here's your dose, goes up on this side. Here's your response to the dose over here. Notice how you have to get a certain amount of dose before anything changes. Now we discussed this term the other day. So somebody remind me, what does this line represent right here? 
It's an amount of medication in the body before a response can happen. That means unmute the mics, time for response. Um, Athens, yours doesn't look muted, but it may be. The therapeutic dose? That is correct, the therapeutic dose. Uh, well, no, well, no, that's not totally, that's really close. Um, therapeutic dose is the actual dose that we have or is the dose that we give to get the desired response. What this is, is the threshold. Um, threshold, meaning this is the minimum amount of medication that has to be in the body before the medication will make any effect on the body at all. The therapeutic dose is going to be the amount of medication that this person needs to get the most appropriate effect with the least amount of side effects. Does that, does that difference make sense to you guys? All right, so now if we have the threshold and then, which is kind of like the minimum amount of medication needed to get a response, then we can have the maximum, the maximum level. Maximum therapeutic. At this point, we know that the patient is not going to have any further benefit from that medication. But could their dose, excuse me, could their response continue to change after that? And the answer is yeah. Yeah, they can continue to have issues after that. Um, or, you know, the med, additional med may continue to cause an effect in their body. And that med, that effect may be undesirable, but um, is not necessarily uh, lethal yet. So then after, so we have our threshold, we have the therapeutic, uh, let, me, let, me, let me do that different. Um, and so we call this the therapeutic window. the range in which the medication will make the effect. But this is where the medication becomes undesirable. But it's not necessarily poisonous. It's not, it can be harmful, but it won't necessarily be lethal. Now, at this range right here, this is what we call the LD50. The LD50, and let me swap back over to here for you guys to see it. The LD50 is the amount of medication that was fatal in 50% of the test subjects. Now, animals we're talking about. Now, the interesting thing is these measurements, and when you go and look up LD50s on meds, these are always done in milligrams or micrograms per kilogram. So it's and, and I've even seen it where it was like micrograms per milligram uh, or gram, micrograms per gram. So depending on if it's like a rabbit or a rat or something like that or a mouse, but they um, these are always in percentages so that can be extrapolated out to the human level and say, well, if, you know, five milligrams per kilogram was lethal here, then that means five milligrams per kilogram are lethal there. So this is the LD50. 50% of the test subjects died at that dose. Now, what that means though is 49% of the test subjects died at a dose lower than that. And 50% of the test subjects died at a dose higher than that. So it is not safe to get close to that LD50. Does that make sense? Just because, oh, the LD50 is 24,000 milligrams per kilogram doesn't mean somebody's not gonna die at 100 milligrams per kilogram. Mm -hmm. Now, that's unlikely, but it's possible. Um, the other point, to, now this points out that you have the lethal dose LD50 and the toxic dose or TD dose. 
50. That is toxic is for inhalation, um, whereas lethal, uh, no, excuse me, I am confusing that with hazmat. Lethal dose is this is where you're um, you're gonna die. Toxic dose is this is the dose where 50% of the population showed negative effects. Like we don't want this to happen anymore. Um, we, we're 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 kind of at the high end, and so that toxic dose may not be the but it's kind of like the maximum dose therapeutic dose like most people after this point are going to have a problem so we're not going to go above this dose um now one of the things that i want to point out on medication safety is we've now got the therapeutic dose and we're going to find a dose somewhere here in the middle oh let me go back to that uh whiteboard for you all right so we're going to find this dose somewhere here in the middle where this is going to be our median dose this is our effective dose um and this is why some people have good response to meds and some people don't they're like ah, didn't really do anything for me doc stop shooting up heroin on the weekends might help you out um but we have that now what i want to point out also is this range here so we have we have this range here and then it also has this range here the big thing we want to worry about is this spot and this spot what's the difference well i i would say actually this right here this difference what is the difference between our median effective dose and our ld50 if for some medications that medic that difference that uh distance between effective dose and ld50 is really wide like there's a huge difference between that and that is a very safe medication other medications there's not a lot of difference between um median effective and lethal where while um that makes the medication very dangerous and this could be something as simple as like if you took two blood pressure pills every day you're okay you take five blood pressure pills in a day you might have some issues you took the whole bottle of blood pressure pills in one day you're probably gonna die like that would be an example of a range now there's other medications and you could take the whole bottle of meds you could take 10 bottles of the meds and you're probably going to be okay you're not going to be at that toxic or uh or you're pro you're not going to be at that lethal dose level but then there's other medications that you're supposed to take one of these every day but if you took four in one day you might die that is a very narrow therapeutic window an example of those medications were maois uh no Sorry, not MAOIs. MAOIs were the safer. They're still not great, but they're safer. Um, tricyclic antidepressants, TCAs, uh, Elevil, uh, stuff like that. Those medications had a very narrow therapeutic window. They were used to treat depression. So great, except depressed people often consider suicide and we're gonna treat their depression with a medication that could make their depression worse, but is, <laughs> incredibly effective at killing them and it would only take a few of the pills definitely the whole bottle would gone like effect so that's a narrow therapeutic window making that medication a rather dangerous medication to give um and so they engineered new meds that are more effective um so you now have our ssris our um, norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors um stuff like that um uh so snris selective neuro nor nor epinephrine reuptake inhibitor so ssris snris things like that they have a much lower ld 50 or excuse me they have a much higher ld50 with a very wide therapeutic window and much safer for patients much less risk of them overdosing on them all right so let's move on to next slide let's see what we got um Oh, yeah, this is the crap I was just talking about. Okay, so immune-mediated responses. These are our patients where we've given the medication, we expect the medication to be fine, everything's like, no big deal, what's the problem? And then all of a sudden, we have weird reactions, weird responses to it. Why are they... Um, uh, 
Why is their body sensitized to this? And this is where we're going to get into the allergic reactions, the anaphylactic reactions, and the anaphylactoid. Now, the intentions of this portion of the class is not to teach you how to treat those and recognize those. But if we remember from our last unit, we talked a little about the immune response and the inflammatory response. We mentioned cells like mast cells and basophils. Mast cells stay in connective tissue, skin, uh, adipose tissue, yada, yada, yada. They're going to just kind of sit there waiting for an infection to come along. Basophils, they're floating through the bloodstream, and these are uh, looking for inflammation and issues. These are both granulocytes, meaning they can release large quantities of product. In the case of mast cells and basophils, those happen to be histamines and leukotrienes. Histamines, they will cause vasodilation. Uh, leukotrienes will also cause vasodilation, but a much longer reaction to it. They also release chemotransmitters that are going to attract other white blood cells to the area. The histamines are going to dilate the blood vessels. They're going to um, open the pores of the blood vessels, causing them to leak uh, more effectively and pumping blood into that tissue, causing the redness, the inflammation, the swelling, the pain, the cardinal signs of inflammation. <laughs> so <clears throat> when a patient's reacting in an immune response to a medication, they can have this widespread reaction where the histamine is being released across their body. They get the hives, they get the redness, they get the swelling. They may start getting their um, difficulty breathing, their tongue swelling, their um, may feel nauseated. These can all be immune uh, reactions, in which case we want to then treat the um, the immune response. So we're going to have to use things like Benadryl and epinephrine, possibly if it becomes anaphylactic, anaphylactic to treat that. We can't remove the medication from their bloodstream. It's not like when you gave, let's say you were wanting to give pain meds and um, you wanted to give one milligram of morphine, but somehow you accidentally gave 10 milligrams of morphine and now the patient's going unresponsive and not breathing adequately. Yeah, that's a problem, but that's not an immune response. That's just an overdose response. Pop them with some Narcan, problem solved. Like opiate goes away, they start breathing. That if you were to give a patient fentanyl or morphine and they started having an allergic reaction to it, they were having an immune mediated response, you can give them Narcan all day long and it would keep them awake and it would keep them breathing, but it would not prevent the re immune response because the immune system is reacting directly to that chemical. It sees that chemical as an antigen. Why? There's a lot of variables on that one. It's a hard one answer because it's different for almost every situation. But something has triggered the immune system to say, you know what? The next thing you see is bad. And then all of a sudden this medication shows up and it types a reaction and creates antibodies to it. So um, now it does... It is necessary to point out that for the immune response to happen, you have to have an organic based material of some sort. It, you're not going to create an immune response to sodium chloride, right? Sodium and chloride are chemical, are elements. They are in the bloodstream all the time. You can't get an immune response to sodium chloride. But if your patient, if, if you're using bacteriostatic, uh, sodium chloride, which is sodium chloride that's been treated with another chemical, a preservative, that will prevent the growth of bacteria. It doesn't kill bacteria, it just inhibits bacterial growth. This is what you'll find in multi-dose vials and stuff like that. The patient can react to those preservatives that have been at the additives. They're not going to react to the sodium chloride. Kind of like when a person says, oh, I'm allergic to epi. Um, your body makes epi. Oh, I'm allergic to diphenhydramine or I'm allergic to glucose. Your body makes these substances, not diphenhydramine, but anyway. Um, the problem is, like with epi, they're not allergic to the epinephrine. They're not allergic to that hormone, obviously, because their body makes it. What they're allergic to is one of the added byproducts in the medication, in that solution that was made to keep it stabilized or to keep it um, preserved or something along those lines. So that's kind of what the problem is there. That's where that's going. All right. Um, Let's see, let's see. Um, 
All right, so tolerance, I think I brought this up the other day. This is where you've had repeated doses of the medication over an extended period of time, and it's created um, a, a, sense, or a lack of sensitivity to it. And we call that tolerance. And I used an example of um, I used the example of receptors. I think I used glucose and insulin or insulin and insulin receptors on the cells because it was a good example of like how type 2 diabetes works where you have what's called, and well actually before I say it, does anybody remember what I named the process that results in tolerance? Does anybody remember? I, I drew a bunch of little circles and dots and receptors and all that on the screen. Do you recall what I called that? Well, it was just on your screen. You can't see it now. All right. What was that? All right, we've got some static or something. Let's say that we have our cell here, and we'll draw it like this, and we've got a bunch of blue receptors on the surface of the cell. Now, remember, these receptors are passive. If any of you are nature nerds and you you know you you like watching um, shows, uh, you know, National Geographic or stuff about um, the um, ocean and all that, you'll see things like the um, coral reefs, sorry. And you have the coral and such growing on the reef. Well, they don't move. They just sit there and wait for the water to blow, wash by and carry nutrients to them. So that means if the water has more nutrients in it, there's a greater likelihood that the nutrients will find the specific receptor on the coral site, right? And that's what they talk about nutrients and all. So anyway, let's say that this is your cell and this cell has all these receptors across it like this, okay? And you put substances in the body that are shaped like pizza because everybody likes pizza, right? Now, if the if diffusion means these substances are all going to be moving and bouncing around from each other eventually one of them will bind to a receptor or maybe two but the higher the density the more of these red triangles that i have the more likely they will be bound to the receptors following more triangles, more receptors, because the receptors can't move and the triangles are moving passively. They're just kind of like floating. So you're waiting for them to happen to bump into each other, kind of like the old Windows um, screensaver where it's got the little window thing bouncing around the screen and bouncing off the sides. All right, so we got this going on, but let's say we put a whole lot of receptors in the blood, or excuse me, not receptors, substance. We have a much higher than normal level of substance. That means the majority of your receptors are bound, and they're bound the majority of the time. So what your cells are going to do is going to say, well, we're always being stimulated by these receptors. We don't need this level of stimulation. We're not going to, we don't need to process this much information. So let's replace ourselves. The next time we replicate, let's reduce the number of receptors. And so your next replication is going to have a lot less. We'll say it gets rid of, and this, this, this is absolutely not scientific, but for the purposes of this class, we'll assume that they get rid of half of the receptors, okay? Now, if half of the receptors are gone, that means more medication is needed, more of the substance will have to be present in order to bind to the receptors that are there. You have to increase that concentration, meaning 
the patient keeps getting the same medication, the body is going to adapt to that high level of medication and result in, or excuse me, they adapt to that high level of medication resulting in a decreased number of receptors, meaning a higher dose of medication is going to be required in order to get the same response as before. This is medication tolerance. And that process of losing number of receptors on the cell is called um, down regulation. They re it's regulating or down regulating the response of the cell by reducing the total number of receptors available on the cell. Now, not all of these work the same way. There's variations, you know, based on the type of receptor that you're dealing with, and so on and so forth. But they aren't. Uh, but they are fairly similar in the general concept. So downregulation can also lead to a condition called cross... What the crap? Um, okay, so my mouse is not working anymore. All right, um, I'm just having all, all the fun in the world today. Oh, that was the one I wanted. Um, all right, cross tolerance. So I mentioned this the other day when we we're talking about opiates. If your patient is taking recreational opiates or even if they're taking prescribed opiates on a regular basis for a chronic condition like chronic back pain or something along those lines, then the patient will have a... Um, a response or, or they will have a diminished response to the pain medication you give. You'll be like, oh yeah, we wanted to help this patient. We wanted to give them pain meds for this broken leg or whatever, but we gave them what we have and it didn't do any good. Well, um, that can't, or that doesn't always uh, work out well. And so you need to uh, be prepared for that. Now, tachyphylaxis. Tachyphylaxis and cross tolerance or down regulation are not exactly the same thing and they are easily confused. So down regulation, like we just said, it's a reduction in the number of cell receptors that is caused by the new cell production and the new cell growth not having the same number of receptors. Tachyphylaxis is when you've given too much of the medication in a short period of time and now you're not getting any reaction anymore. So this could mean that the medication is still bound to the receptors on the cells or whatever the effect is and it hasn't released. It caused its effect, but it hasn't released from the cell to allow a new um, molecule to bind and the addition of a more medication to the system is not going to improve. And so the, in a very short knit window, they got a lot of doses and now it's not working anymore. So that is the down regulation. That is one of the, um, excuse me, that is tachyphylaxis. That is one of the forms of intolerance or medication tolerance that you're going to see. If you just stop giving the meds for a little while, problem solved. We can actually see this. Um, it happens in a way with patients who are taking uh, a lot of antidepressants or ADD meds, anxiety meds, and all that. You'll notice that they have to change these meds on a regular, uh, on a semi-regular basis. And maybe every six months they have to change their dose, or their doctor will have them on a medication for a while and then take them off the medication or put them on something else and then f swap them back. That's so they don't develop this cross tolerant, excuse me, this um, tachyphylaxis or whatever. Now, tachyphylaxis is normally going to refer to like a short hospital stay, a much narrower window of time, but these are examples of where patient created a tolerance and now we have to change the medication as a result. Um, all right, so I think these are clear. Stimulants and depressants tend to be of, um, more commonly abused than others. Uh, now, the difference of what is misuse? Misuse is taking the medication in doses or timing that you that are not recommended. Misuse does not necessarily constitute addiction. It does not necessarily constitute abuse, but it could be considered reckless or irresponsible because you're increasing your risk of an effect that you didn't intend. Now, abuse is when you're using the medication 
regardless or and it is causing negative impact on you you are hurting your body by using this substance now have um others would even classify the abuse as being like you are um well no excuse me addiction is when you are must use the drug even though you know it hurts you even though you know it's abuse but you you're compulsory you have to use it compulsory you cannot uh avoid it habituation this is where it's just a habit okay um an example of this would be like i don't smoke or this isn't me but i've heard people say this like oh i don't smoke but i only smoke when i'm drinking i have a habit of smoking when i'm drinking i go to the bar i have a cigarette okay so that's a habit that's habituation they're not dependent on it they're not addicted to the nicotine they could go for a very long time and not have a cigarette and be okay but every time they go to drink they have a cigarette now the question could be how often do you go drink you know this is all day every day well then i think we have a different issue here but you get the point i'm making it's a habit it's not necessarily a dependence and it's not necessarily an addiction so there are a number of these variations uh various terms related to this all right um now occasionally our medications will interact in ways that we didn't expect with other meds or we will actually intend for them to interact together and this could be desirable or undesirable there are times where if you were to give a uh, medication like dopamine while you were giving a medication like calcium chloride this could cause an interaction and they would precipitate in the bloodstream uh, mag sulfate will do the same thing if you were to mix mag or um, sodium bicarb with uh, calcium chloride it could create that precipitation so meaning it'll crystallize well that's a very undesirable interaction you do not want that to happen but a good interaction could be the fact that let's say i give fenugrin and i give morphine well normally this patient would need like 10 milligrams of morphine which is a lot of morphine to cause this effect or they'd need 25 milligrams of fenugrin to fix their nausea but if i gave them two milligrams of morphine and 12 and a half of fenugrin lower than normal or lower than needed doses for both it has a much greater effect than it did if i were to give either one and that is where they are improving the effect they're in helping or uh, they they are interacting in a desirable way um and so but we do need to watch out for the incompatibilities now we're not necessarily going to uh uh go through every single incompatibility that's possible uh, during this course of this um, lecture today but while you're making your drug cards i hope you're looking for in the contraindications special in, uh, concerns and such like that look for in drug incompatibilities do not give this med with or do not give this med in the same line as that kind of stuff um, those are your uh, incompatibilities All right, so now we're going to go into principles of pharmacokinetics. This gets into a new topic, new category. We've been doing this for about 50 minutes now. Let's go ahead and take a quick break. All right. All right. So, principles of pharmacokinetics. All right, so what are pharmacodynamics? Interaction of the body with drugs. What is being changed? We have the drug and the body during pharmacodynamics. It's the interaction of the two, but which one is being changed? The interaction of the body on the drug. That is pharmacokinetics. So when you, pharmacodynamics is what effect does the drug have on the body? Pharmacokinetics is what effect does the body have on the drug? So once the medication has been administered, as it says here in this slide, once the medication has been administered, the body starts removing it. It's trying to break it down. It's trying to remove and get it out of the system. So that's the pharmacokinetics. But everything we were talking about before, how the drug binds to receptors, causes changes in the body and things like that, that's the pharmacodynamics. That's what's going to change in the body because of the drug. All right. So duration and effectiveness, blah, blah, blah. You know, how long is it going to work? How does it get removed out of the body? What's it going to do here? Uh, route of administration, clinical status of the patient. Now, what do you think? I feel like dose and route make perfect sense. Like, why? you know, no big deal there. But what about clinical status? What does that mean? What is it talking about clinical status of the patient? Uh, 
like their vital signs like blood pressure and heart rate. So if their heart rate is higher, then it's going to be pushed through the body and therefore expel faster. Very good point. So generally, if their heart rate is higher, it may indicate that their metabolism is higher as well, which makes it biometabolized and eliminated faster. But um, let's go the other direction with that. Let's say their heart rate is higher, but what is a common cause of increased heart rate? Kind of like in a negative sense. The what? Inflammation. I heard drug. It was it drugs. I heard. So inflammation. Yeah, you can do it. Um, and I was going to go a little more extreme, but like they let's say shock. Shock is a common response. Um, excuse me. Tachycardia is a common response to shock. Well, in shock, the patient doesn't have adequate perfusion. The drug isn't moving, or the blood isn't moving through the system and getting to all the distant tissues the way it should. So if a patient is in shock and you were to give them a medication. <clears throat> Even let's say you gave it IV in the hand, but they're in shock. It's a really good chance that it's not going to get effectively transported into the circulation because the bloodstream or the blood flow in that area isn't if adequate at the moment. Um, so. so here we go. This is how the body is going to remove the medication from the body. So. We have these different profile, uh, time frames. Onset, how long before it's absorbed and distributed, what its absorption and distribution is uh, going to be. That's like peak uh, effect and then duration, how long before the body can get rid of it. Um, so these are, the, these are the terms or these are the factors that we want to balance. And I think a good example of this could be that we're probably all very familiar with is the use of Tylenol, like to say treat a fever. Um, give somebody Tylenol. We understand that Tylenol is, uh, you know, given orally, which means it has to be ingested and um, digested and absorbed through the GI tract and then enter the bloodstream and be carried through the body in order to do its job. Now, that doesn't happen immediately. It can take 20, 30 minutes for it to get absorbed into the GI tract. So your onset could be anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes or so for your onset of Tylenol. But before you really feel like it's doing any good, before you feel like the fever's gone, that could be two two hours before you've got that peak effect going on. But then how long does Tylenol last? It may stay in your system, you know, six hours. It may stay on, only be feel effective for four hours or but you know, six to eight hours is generally the recommendation. So that's the duration before it will be metabolized and removed. So now, um, most of the medications that we're going to give in the field are going to be given in the IV route. Now, we can some of them can be given IM, and a few of them are PO or sublingual. Uh, PO example would be aspirin, sublingual obviously nitroglycerin. Those pretty much are it. We don't really see a lot of other PO. Um, in the pre-hospital environment. Uh, for a little while, we used to carry Tylenol in the ambulance for uh, pediatric fevers. Uh, specifically kids that had had a febrile seizure, but we don't carry that anymore. It's frankly just not effective. Um, if the patient has seized from a febrile seizure, then they're probably not going to seize again. It's not that they won't, it's just they probably won't because seizures are caused in those cases by the, the speed at which the temperature increases, not the height of the temperature. So they didn't have a seizure because their temp is 102. They had a seizure because their temp went from 98.9 to 102 in 15, 20 minutes. That's what caused the seizure. So once they already seized and you're there, yeah, they have a temp of 102 and yes, they should get Tylenol, but they're, not gonna they're likely not going to have another seizure as a result of this. So us giving the Tylenol, which is PO, it's going to take 45 minutes to hit effect, maybe even two hours to hit peak effect. So yeah, not as not really something that's going to fix anything for us in the short term. So therefore, not effective. If the kid's still seizing from the fever, well, we're not going to give them Tylenol anyway because it's PO. So these are the reasons we're just not seeing Tylenol in the truck anymore. Some of you may still carry it on the truck. Some of you may still use it. That's great. It's good. I'm just kind of pointing out it's less than ideal as far as a pre-hospital medication um, for those reasons. Now, 
Why does a drug have to be given PO or IM? Um, and this is, you know, let's think about the chemical properties here. Some could argue it's like, well, you know, it's too concentrated if you give it I, IV or IM. Well, you give a lower dose, right? You know, we have to give higher doses of PO medications simply because so much of it is destroyed by the GI tract, the acid in the stomach and such like that, and um, eliminated and metabolized in first pass metabolism. We'll get there. Um, but it's just immediately uh, filtered before it even gets to the system. Um, we talked about that, like the uh, gas, the oral versus rectal route of medication administration and bloodstream a little bit last week. All right, another thing to think about is chemical properties. Um, let's say, for example, insulin, all right? Insulin is a hormone. It is um, administered as an IM injection, but why isn't it given as a pill? Why is insulin to date not given as a pill? Well. As a hormone, it is a protein-based hormone. Our stomach has acids and another uh, enzyme called pepsin, which is specifically designed to break down protein bonds, peptide bonds. So if you gave insulin PO, the stomach acid and stomach enzymes and digestive enzymes would break it down and destroy it, and it would not have, it would not effectively absorb into the bloodstream. So it has to be given IM because its chemical properties won't allow it to be given PO. Now, I know that there's some experiments going on. They're currently trying to research a oral in, um, insulin of some form. Whether that's going to end up being insulin, I don't know, or you know something that stimulates the production of insulin, or even more likely a version of insulin that has been fortified with another medic with another chemical substance that won't allow it to be destroyed by the um, um, body so what they call it would be a, a like a pro hormone where it's not the full level of the hormone whatever it is it gets absorbed into the body into the bloodstream and then gets converted into insulin that's probably the the direction they're going but that's a lot of chemistry and so it's probably why they we don't have something like that yet now of course, we understand that not always we don't always have the same routes available. There are times and places where we will use an IV route very effectively because it's easy to get it. There's other times you may end up having to give a patient glucagon during a hypoglycemic event because we couldn't get an IV established in an adequate amount of time. Or maybe we started the IO route because we didn't have um, the IV established or something like that. Uh, routes of admin, you guys can study routes of admin, speed of onset, stuff like that. You can handle that one. Um, all right. Now, bioavailability, this is how much of the unchanged medication is going to reach your systemic circulation. And this is a really interesting uh, study when you start looking at various meds. Now, when we give a medication via IV, it's like 100%. 99 and 100% of the medication that we inject in that IV is going to get to their systemic circulation because we're putting it in a vein and it's going straight into the heart. No big deal. When we do it IM, it's a little bit less, but it's still a very, very high percentage, whether it's coming in through the lymphatic system or through the vascular system, very high percentage of that medication is going to make it into the systemic circulation. However, if a medication is absorbed orally through the GI tract, it's not all going to make it into systemic circulation because the bloodstream, the blood vessels around the GI tract go to the liver first, where the liver starts to detoxify it, removing some of the medication. Then the blood leaves the liver, goes to the heart, again, goes through the whole body. And if we were to do a blood draw, we're going to do the blood draw on a peripheral vasculature. We're not going to be able to do it on the hepatic portal vein, something like that. We're not going to do surgery down into their chest to find out, well, how much of the medication got absorbed? We're only going to know how much medication made it to their systemic circulation. And that's where we will call bio, bio availability. And so you'll see a lot of what studies when they're trying to determine the effectiveness of a medication is um, they'll do things like, oh, well, how much change did the person feel or whatever? But before that, they'll do studies like, all right, if I give you 100 milligrams here, how much will you have in your bloodstream at this time and at this time and at this time? And that's where they get bioavailability from. 
So while you don't need to know what the bioavailability of each medication is, understand that that's what makes the differences of doses. That's why a PO dose may be higher than an IM or an IV dose, but it also is a matter of um, how the process, the, the process of elimination, eliminating the medication from the body. All right, so here's some things that you gotta have in place if you wanna use the GI tract. Obviously the GI tract has to be functional. There has to be liquids in the body to carry the medication. If you don't have adequate hydration in the GI tract, the medication isn't going to be carried to the um, intestines. If your stomach is mostly empty and you give somebody a med, they're probably, or you take the med, you're probably not going to be able to move it into the GI tract and you're just going to sit there in the stomach acid. So that's why a lot of meds say, oh, take with food or take with a meal or something like that so that it gets carried into the GI tract. That also dilutes the, um, excuse me, the stomach acid. All right. Um, of course, you can see the other issues here about being able to swallow or you know, have an NG tube, OG tube in place. Does anybody carry NG or OG tubes? It's the same tube. It's a matter of which hole you put it in. NG tubes or OG tubes on your ambulances. National, do you guys have them? Negative. Golden Triangle, what about y'all? Wait, there you are. There you are. No, sir, we do not have a well for some reason we have them in stock, but we're not allowed to use them. I work with our new medical director about oh, oh, okay. All right. And then Savannah, do y'all have them? See your camera's still not working. <laughs> Roswell, do you guys do you know? Negative no. Okay. All right. So again, so there you go probably not going to be an option available to you all right so endotracheal please don't do this ever like please do not do this it used to be recommended and you'll talk to the old school guys and they'll be oh yeah we used to you know back in my day we put the meds down the tube and blah 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 there's so many things wrong with that statement, with that bragging. Like, I don't even know where to begin with this problem. Yes, it's a recommended treatment. Yes, it's a treatment that's been used. Yes, it could work. But look at what it says here. If you're going to give a medication via the endotracheal tube, you have to give two to two and a half times the medication. Okay? So let's say our patient's in cardiac arrest and I need to give them a milligram of epinephrine, which is comes in as concentration of epi one to 10,000. So that's one milligram in 10 milliliters of fluid. But I gotta give it to them down the tube because that's the only route of administration I have for some crazy reason. All right, I gotta give 20 to 25 milliliters. I gotta give two to two and a half milligrams, which is 20 to 25 milliliters of water. 20 to 25 milliliters of water plus another five to 10 milliliters of flesh. So I'm looking at this point, 30 to 35 milliliters of fluid going down the tube. 30 milliliters of fluid. That is a lot of fluid, people. And we all start choking and gagging if we're, you know, we swallow wrong while we're drinking a Coke. Like, and we're talking about throwing all that down in the fluid. It's just gonna wash this surfactant out. Yes, it will absorb, but we're trying to keep these lungs working and we're just gonna ruin them that way. So please do not use the endotracheal route of administration. It is in the books, it is in the protocols, it is not highly recommended, but it is still there and people like to brag about it. I, that's their prerogative, but avoid it. We have IOs. We have IVs, and I know we may not always have the I IV available, like we may not be able to get the IV, but you do an EJ. You can do a humoral head IO. You could do a uh, pro proximal um, tibial IO. These are very effective methods of insertion. Now, believe it or not, let's say your department doesn't have an easy IO kit. Okay, you don't have one. A old-fashioned gym shitty um Jim Sheedy, sorry, uh, IV, um, pediatric IO catheter. You can use it on an adult. Yes, it's going to be a little harder. Going to take a little more force. I, yeah, but you can use it. Use the same technique, twisting it and all that in, just like the easy IOs do. And we'll go over IOs next week, or not next week, on the 7th, a little bit. We'll play with them in person. <coughs> Excuse me. But 
Um, you don't need, uh, do not use the endotracheal tube. Also, the thing that bugs me with this case is, why does your patient have an ET tube in a cardiac in this scenario, in a cardiac arrest, but you don't have an IV, you don't have other um, access established? Like that's just not helpful. So, but we'll get to ET tubes and cardiac arrests later. All right, internasal, great new route, although it's finicky. It can be very effective when done properly. Has anybody in this class had the opportunity to personally administer an intranasal administration? All right, I, get, I think that's Brad. Is that Brad in the background and Mike? Okay, all right, I got a couple of people. Um, so yeah, how hard was it? Was it effective? Tell me about it. Okay. Now, was it a one that you did manually or was it an auto injector kind? Manually. Cool. All right. The auto injectors are a little easy, are obviously a lot easier to use, but um, the Narcan, or excuse me, the manually, it's a little trickier. Mike, how about you? What did you do? Uh, I ironically updated Narcan as well, nasally. It, was it through the manual you did it or an auto injector kind of thing did it? manual okay so when you're doing a medication nasally it's important that you uh, split the medication between both nares remember the person has two nostrils so you want to give half the dose in one side half the dose in the other side often a lot of the medications will require a, a much higher dose um, for the absorption Yes, it's absorbed uh, rapidly, and yes, what is absorbed has a near 100% bioavailability, but not all of it gets absorbed. And I, I know that sounds like I'm contradicting myself, but <clears throat> for it to work, the mist has to be incredibly fine. If it's not a ultra fine mist, it doesn't get absorbed. It just turns into like snot running down the back of their throat. If they can taste it, if they can feel it, then they're not getting it absorbed. It's just drill, drooling down the back of their neck. That's not helpful. So this is why it has to be, you want to do half of it in each nostril to increase your um, absorption area. And you squeeze that manual device very hard and very aggressively to get a maximum amount of spray. That way it atomizes it. It doesn't literally atomize it, but it creates very, very small uh, particles or um, droplets that will spray into the nose. So it's very important for that to be given appropriately. IV, I don't really think we need to talk about um, how effective the IV is. Now, we understand this. There are certain patients that we're going to have a hard time getting the IV established on and <clears throat> there are side effects. We will talk about the side effects later on today. Interosseous. Some interosseous in injection, excuse me, routes of administration are more rapid and more effective than IV. For example, a humoral head IO can be more uh, rapid and give larger quantity than a AC vein. It can. Now it hurts more and you have to be more particular about the position of the arm. It's very important that the arm be adducted abducted as such, but, excuse me, adducted and, um, in order for the injection site to maintain position. If you have a particularly thin patient, it doesn't cause as much issue if you bring their arm down, but when you have a person who has got a lot of body fat or a very developed muscle mass on their shoulders, well, if they start moving that arm around at all for whatever reason, that can pop the needle back out. So it is a bit trickier to get the IO to stay in position on the humoral head. I found the proximal tibia to be a much more secure site, and much less likely to dislodge it during care, especially on a cardiac arrest patient, simply because I'm trying to do chest compressions. I don't need their arms stuck up here. Now, I've read some and I've seen some people talk about where the patient uh, they rotate the arm inward and lay it down and they're able to find the sites that way and do that and that can work. Um, 
for a, a patient who has very underdeveloped shoulders, like an elderly person who's got muscle atrophy and such like that. But you start getting somebody who's really overweight or uh, large muscles, it's just not gonna be as effective. Now, obviously you can't use an IO if the fr there's a fracture in that bone, okay? It doesn't matter if there's fractures in other bones, but if there's a fracture in that bone or risk of a fracture in that bone, you shouldn't use it. You also can't use it if the patient, you can't use the distal, uh, the proximal tibia if the per person has had a knee, knee replacement, but that's kind of a different, different thing. You also can't use them on uh, amputees. Because it's not there. <laughs> All right, intramuscular. Great route. However, it says intramuscular, not intraadipose. So it is important that you recognize the uh, amount of adipose tissue your patient has and use an appropriate length needle when giving an intramuscular injection. A lot of people tend to carry a extra body weight in their shoulders and their arm, upper arms or in their buttocks. These are all locations that we would use for an intramuscular injection. So don't... Um, <clears throat> So make certain that they have, uh, that you have a long enough needle to actually get into, um, you have to get the needle long enough to get into the muscle set. Somebody sent me an email, sorry. Um, all right, so some medications are not appropriate most of the ones that we're going to deal with, if we can give it IV, we can give it IM. Most of them are that case. In fact, some it's better to give IM because it causes less irritation. Fenugreen is one that's been given IM for a very long time because it causes less irritation giving it that route than through the IV route. But there's ways to uh, compensate for that. We'll talk about, I'll show you some stuff on, I'll see if I can get a uh, somebody to come by later on today, uh, and I'll show you some techniques for some of these administrations. Um, right now, we're just trying to discuss the benefits of them. All right, sub-Q, um, again, now sub-Q incidentally is into the adipose tissue. You're going below the cutaneous layer into that dermal layer, <clears throat> and you're getting into that adipose tissue. So this is in the adipose tissue. This is going to cause a slower absorption because there's less blood flow through there. It will be absorbed um, more controlled. This is one of the reasons we used it for a really long time for the use of epi 1 to 1,000 during anaphylactic reactions because the patient would absorb the epi slower, causing less of a shock load on the heart. Now, Yes, it works slower. We can now do it, or well, it's now recommended that you can do it IM. The state of Georgia, for example, recommends it being given IM simply for, uh, honestly, for simplicity's sake, then all our meds are IM. Uh, Epi sub-Q was the only, excuse me, Epi was the only sub-Q medication that we had been giving up to this time. A very common medication to be given um, sub-Q would be Insulin, I know I made a comment earlier where I said it was an intramuscular injection. It is not intramuscular. It's not IM. It is a sub-Q injection. Um, <clears throat> but um, it's probably the next most common um, medication. Of course, we don't give that one pre-hospitally, but we can assist a patient with the use of their own. All right, dermal and transdermal, these are patches. This is going across the skin. Um, <clears throat> so this could be like a fentanyl patch, blood pressure patch, nitro patch, or we could put paste on a pad and slap a nitro paste across their chest. These are all options for that. All right, uh, now this is a big problem here, bioavailability on your sublingual medications. Remember the other day I was mentioning that we can give nitroglycerin because it has to be biotransformed in the bloodstream um, because nitric acid is such a potent medication and effective medication. They convert it to nitroglycerin where you have to give a lot more to get it in. Well, another part of that is low bioavailability. You put it under the tongue. Yeah, you're gonna get some of it absorbed into the mucous membranes there, 
but you're constantly producing saliva in your mouth. It's diluting it, washing it down your throat, and then it's getting destroyed in your stomach. It's not going to get absorbed that way. So this is why your bioavailability is so low. Now, yes, the patient has to be awake when this is done. We, um, yeah, I don't think there was anything else I needed to say on that one. Of course, we understand what this is, nebulizers, you know, straight into the lungs. Again, very easy absorption, very high absorption, um, so on and so forth. All right. Rectal route. Why do we use the rectal route? Well, maybe the patient's unresponsive. If you can't, if they're unresponsive and the medication's supposed to be orally administered, give it rectally. If they're unresponsive and the patient's supposed to receive a medication IV, but it, you are not able to establish an IV for whatever reason, you can use the rectal route. This is going to be particularly more likely in your infant population. Let's say you have a hypoglycemic infant that needs uh, D10 or D50. Well, it's going to be a little bit easier to give it rectally versus trying to establish an IV on that patient. But this can be done with any age. Another common route of rectal administration is, excuse me, a common use of rectal administration is benzodiazepines to stop seizures. Now, it used to be the only way we could do seizure control was either through an IM or an IV administration, which could take a little while. But uh, now we can do, like Ver said, he's a, via the internasal route. So even while they're seizing, you can spray it up their nose. It's effective. It works. Uh, a lot of families will have what's called Dystat, which is a uh, benzodiazepine that's supposed to stop seizures. And it is designed in a paste form with an intra or with a rectal administration um, tube. So they'll use the Dystat on the patient before you get there if they have a known seizure history. So that's another use for it. Of course, if the patient's vomiting or has a reason they can't swallow, like they had a stroke or something along those lines, the rectal route could be useful. When a person has long-term uh, care and they're not able to use their oral route on a regular, like th can't swallow or something like that, they're probably going to end up with a peg tube or a gastric tube of some sort it, to make the gastric route or um, the PO route if, um, an option. That way you don't have to continue to um, violate them more or less with your medication. Now, most of the time, the medications that are going to be given rectal or prescribed for the rectal route are in wax-based suppositories that melt at body temperature, which means you don't want that sucker sitting in your fingers for very long. It'll get nasty. But we can administer liquids through the rectal route. So the question came up the other day, can you give D50? Yeah, you can give D50. I would take a syringe of D50 and put a the catheter, not the needle, the catheter from like a 16 or a 14 gauge IV catheter, screw that to the end, lube up the tip and insert it that way, injecting it. So pediatric, adult, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's a very small tube insertion and uh, it's an effective means of administering a liquid. You can do that with Versed. You could do that with, you know, like like a benzo or something like that. Those are the times that I would say it's necessary. Um, other than that, probably not going to be that big of a deal. Or you could go for a different route, like an IO or something like that. Like I would rather not poke you know, pin cushion an infant with hypoglycemia trying to get an IV established or start an IO on an infant that, you know, it's only hypoglycemia. Why not just use the rectal route? That is effective. Okay, we're not going to do this. The only thing we're going to use with the eyes is um, irrigation, but we're you're probably never going to see medications administered through the optic um, uh, you know, thalamic, you know, eye drops or whatever in the back of the ambulance, that is. All right. So as the patient or as the medication enters the body, it has to be moved throughout the body in various forms. And as you can see here, these are uh, important factors. We kind of brought up that earlier, like the patient's clinical presentation, their blood pressure, their uh, body fluid content. So are they hydrated, dehydrated, whatever it happens to be. Now, 
these barriers that are talking about, some of the ones that we're most concerned about is the blood brain barrier. There are certain things that will not pass through the barrier from the bloodstream to the brain. An example of this would be dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter used in the brain to um, you know, communicate from one neuron to the next. But dopamine can also be given as an IV. However, dopamine is the neurotransmitter responsible for feeling good. You know, it's been said, oh, you don't like donuts. You just like the dopamine your, bro your brain secretes when you eat a donut or something along those lines. Well, when a if we give a patient dopamine as a vasoconstrictor, it doesn't make them feel euphoric. It doesn't make them feel happy and all that because dopamine can't cross that barrier. Another example, that's the case with most of our um, neurotransmitters, <coughs> you know, uh, serotonin, um, melatonin, a lot of these, um, very few of them will actually pass through the brain barrier. So that's why we don't give patients medication, uh, you know, a ser here's a serotonin pill. We give them a serotonin reuptake inhibitor that will uh, uh, affects how the body absorbs, reabsorbs the serotonin. It's not actually a dose of serotonin. Um, another barrier that we'll hear a lot more about is the blood placental barrier. This is preventing um, certain chemicals in the mother's blood from passing into the placenta and therefore prevents it from passing into the um, infant's blood. That doesn't work with all medications. A lot of medications, especially your benzos and your opiates, will pass through that barrier and enter the, feed, uh, the fetal blood circulation. There is a blood testy barrier that prevents certain medications and such from, or actually prevents a lot of things from passing into the testes because the testes are where the um, reproductive cells are produced, the sperm and all that. Um, they, the, there's a barrier to prevent most chemicals from getting in there and altering that reproduction. All right, we brought up osmosis. Tell me what is osmosis? Conyers, y'all been quiet. Tell me about osmosis. Um, where your body makes a solution equal on those sides. So you're right, but what is moving in order to make that solution equal? The, yep, the fluid. The fluid is moving in order to make the solution equal on both sides. <clears throat> All right. Um, so as fluid moves from one portion of the body to another, it uh, creating that balance of um, or altering the balance on either side of the membrane it's the passageways that the fluid moves through will often carry the medication with it. So osmosis or the lack thereof can inhibit or affect how medication is distributed. If the patient is dehydrated and crenated and most of their blood is in the vessels and osmosis is an abonin, they're not sending water into their, uh, excuse me, most of the water is in the blood vessels. They're not sending water into their um, third space and into the cells. Well, it's going to be really hard for the medication to get there as well. So that's why adequate hydration is really important for this. Another reason, oftentimes you'll see at the hospital, persons receiving a medication via IV, they're gonna be receiving IV fluids as well in order to ensure adequate distribution. <clears throat> All right, filtration. Where does filtration happen predominantly in the body? Yep. And specifically in the nephron's glomerulus capsule uh, or Bowman's capsule. That is where it will happen. That is where we will see filtration most frequently. All right. So we know that our skin cells are supposed to create a barrier for moisture and prevent moisture transfer and such like this. But it is not an impermeable barrier. We, while we don't typically absorb, um, water through our skin 
we can in some small senses we can absorb a lot of other medications through our skin however if we have excessive oils or sweat or other things like or even dirt on our skin it can prevent that absorption <clears throat> I kind of already talked about all this. All right, so plasma protein binding. So plasma, the liquid of the blood, proteins. There are proteins in the blood. Does anybody remember? Because we did talk about this in A&P. Can somebody, I'll pick on Golden Triangle. Can somebody from Golden Triangle tell me what is the name of the most common plasma protein? albumin yep albumin albumin is the most common protein in the plasma so do you guys know uh remind me what is hemoglobin it is the part inside the red blood cell that binds to oxygen. But what is it specifically? It, it, you are correct. That is correct. But what type of um, molecule is it? What class? Yes, it is a protein. So hemoglobin is a protein, binds to oxygen, carries oxygen. So plasma proteins like albumin being a protein, they can bind to other elements and carry them. So some medications will bind to that albumin, just like oxygen binds to the to hemoglobin, and be transported through this, the body, and that's how they reach their target destination. A neat thing about that is if you have a fair amount of albumin and you dump a bunch of medication in there and it all binds up and it has a high affinity for the albumin, great. And then it'll slowly be released over a longer period of time. This is one of the ways they do time release medications. So you may remember, you know, when I was a kid, you wanted to buy Sudafed. Sudafed lasted for eight hours, um, six to eight hours. You had to redose. Then all of a sudden, here's 12 hour Sudafed. And now you can get 24 hour Sudafed, which it's the same amount of medication that you got if you took three eight hour doses, but you take it once and it lasts the whole time. That's part of generally the plasma protein binding. There are other methods, but that is one of the most common. <clears throat> All right, now lipophilic medications can be sequestered in fat tissue. I know I just read that, I'm sorry. But this is an interesting thing to keep in mind. If your medication is lipophilic, it is fat-based, it likes fat cells, it will enter adipose tissue. It will enter the fat cells as they're being um, produced and then they will stay in those fat cells until that fat cell is destroyed, removed, uh, lysed, or something like that in the future. You ever heard of somebody having flashbacks from the 60s? You ever heard that, Tan? Oh, I think I was just having a flashback from my, day my Woodstock days. Anybody ever heard? Do what? The LSD gets trapped in the fat. LSD is lipophilic. It is a lipid-based medication. It will move into the fat. So when they were younger using LSD, certain amounts of it was being sequestered into their fat cells and then sitting in their fat cells for years until all of a sudden through apoptosis or some other process, that fat cell got metabolized, broken down and in, in its contents released and there was a small amount of LSD released into their bloodstream. This is a um, not so uncommon problem with fat, fat soluble and fat -philic, lipophilic medications. All right, so. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Excuse me. Volume of... You have a question? All right, volume of distribution. What this is talking about is when you give a patient a medication, what amount of it is in their bloodstream? If you're going to do like a serum blood test and say, oh, look, they have this many milliliters per deciliter or something like that. How much of it is there? So when a patient has a um, low volume distribution, what it's saying is they're going to have higher levels present in the plasma, meaning it's going to stay in the blood. It's staying in the plasma. Yeah, it's getting distributed. It's The plasma's pumping it throughout the body, but it's not going into the other cells. Um, it doesn't want to change uh, its location. So you see higher levels in the plasma for a longer period of time. So when it's talking about spreading, it's talking about getting it outside of the blood vessels to where it's gonna cause its effect. Now, I discussed this the other day, brought it up, biotransformation. This is when the body works on that medication to alter its structure and things like that in order for it to cause an effect in the body and you know, make the desired effect. Now, what was an example, what is a drug I've used several times, even today, to describe biotransformation? Thank you. Nitroglycerin. I mentioned it several times. Nitroglycerin is an inactive metabolite and has to be biotransformed into the active metabolite nitric acid. And that's what causes the pharma, you know, the pharmacological effect that we're looking for. Other medications, <clears throat> such as Tylenol, for example, we ingest it, it is an active metabolite, it will start doing its job. But there are um, enzymes acetocysteine being one of them in the produced by the li liver that binds to it removes it creating an inactive metabolite and preventing it from having a an effect on the body this is acetylcysteine and um the liver uses a system to uh function a lot of the biotransformation whether it's becoming active or inactive um yeah, I just said all that. Okay, so like I just said, the liver, there is this uh, system called the cytochrome P450 system. And this is a series of reactions that change a medication from one to another or cause transformation. It uses enzymes and uses chemicals and such to make this happen. Enzymes play a huge role in this. And this is one of, this is probably the primary way our liver can remove toxins from our blood. No matter what the toxin is, it's probably going to use the P450 system. It's very large. Do not try to understand it understand that it's in the liver it is um converting the medication to a level to a substance that can be then removed from the body once it's been biotransformed it can um it'll go to the kidneys or to the lungs to be ex exhaled or excreted now other parts of the body can also do this. The liver isn't the only part. It's just the liver is the likely place, the very mo the most common location for this stuff to happen. All right. Um, <clears throat> all right. Elimination. I put this out, but just mentioned this already. Most most medication is eliminated through the kidneys uh, in urine. Some medication is eliminated through the respiratory tract. Give me an example of a chemical that is commonly eliminated in the respiratory tract. It's not the only, but it is a common location of elimination. Carbon dioxide. Okay, that is an excellent example of a chemical that's eliminated through the respiratory tract. Um, very good, yes. Um, <laughs> Funny, you know, and that was much simpler than what I was thinking. I was thinking alcohol um, because we um, we do exhale alcohol and eliminate. That's one of the way, ways we eliminate it. It is not the first um, and it is not the primary, but it is one of them. But yeah, excellent example, carbon dioxide. All right, so here's two different ways we have elimination, okay? And zero and first order, zero order and first order. All right. So zero order, a fixed amount of substance is removed during a certain period of time. All right. The way our body removes alcohol from our blood is zero order elimination. This means that whether you drank one 
drink or 10 drinks, you will only remove so much alcohol over, uh, you know, in an hour. You can only get rid of so much in an hour. And that's why you'll see things like, oh, you're not allowed to drink before, you know, six hours before, eight hours before, 12 hours before, something like that, because they want to guarantee there's enough time for the alcohol to be removed from your system. That's zero order elimination. It doesn't matter how much chemical is in your blood, only a certain amount will be removed in per hour per minute. The more common method is first order elimination. Now this is in Star Wars. This means that the more medication you have, or the more chemical you have, the more will be re released. And if you've ever heard of the term half-lifes, um, the half-life of a medication, not the video game. Half-life of a medication is the amount of time that the total quantity of medication has been reduced by half. Okay, so generally medications we measure with half-lives, we're going to be talking first order elimination. It's the amount of time that half of the medication was removed from the body. So if you have, um, you know, no matter how much medication, excuse me, as you increase the amount of medication, more of that chemical medication, whatever it happens to be, more of it will be eliminated in that same period of time. So when you're measuring the half-life, say you want to measure the half-life of, ni of nitroglycerin, which I believe is like six hours, but that means that in six hours, half of what you gave will be there. Now, and in, um, you know, 12 hours, a quarter of what you initially gave will be there and half of it will go away in each of those windows. So um, <clears throat> another, so an example would be if you gave one milligram, which is a ridiculous quantity, if you gave one milligram of nitroglycerin, well, six hours later, they're going to have half a milligram. If you had given 10 milligrams of nitroglycerin, well, six hours later, they're only going to they're going to have five milligrams. So you see the amount eliminated increased in the same amount of time because the amount of the medication increased. So first order, as the amount increases, the amount of elimination increases. Zero order, set amount, set rate, no change. This much will be eliminated in an hour period. Oh, look at that. <clears throat> half-life <clears throat> okay so any questions on half-life and zero and first order elimination somebody ask some questions from Athens. sure it's not necessarily related to those uh, previous topics, but there was a question on one of the pre assignments about um, the emergency department physician considering administration of some ethanol to a patient who's been poisoned due to drinking ethylene glycol. Yep. So I was just wondering if you could talk more about that process within the body. Yes. Um, tell you what, I think we're actually going to get to that here shortly or something like that. If we move into the next section and you know, we haven't, I will come back to you, uh, to that question. So I guess everybody knows how to play Half-Life and um, with Star Wars characters now, right? Great question, sir. Half-Life 3 will never come out. <laughs> All right. Uh, does that make sense to you guys? <clears throat> you got it. Our med dosing is going to be based on how the body is going to eliminate it. And uh, we don't want to overdose them because they can't eliminate it fast enough. So if that is the case, ooh, ooh, here's a good one. All right. So this is a case. If the patient's dose should only should be commensurate to their ability to eliminate it, what are some things that we would look for to indicate that maybe we need to do a smaller dose? Renal failure is a good one. That's a very... Okay. Yep, if it's a flu, if it's a high volume of fluid, if they have CHF, you could overload them. But let's say if um, they have heart failure, 
they may, may not be able to circulate the medication as effectively. But let's say they don't have renal failure. Maybe they just have renal disease. They have a decreased renal function. That means while they are still producing urine, they're not producing urine as effectively. So you're going to want to control the dose. You want to go with the lower doses. So when you'll see this more commonly in the elderly patients, if your dose, if your medication has a dose range, you'll often shoot for the lower range in the um, elderly patient in an effort to um, avoid hitting that max or in, in order to avoid uh, overpowering their elimination system and creating a temporary toxicity. So you can actually create a toxicity to the medication um, when, e excuse me, even though uh, you gave the correct dose, you were in the right dose range. All right. Yeah. So this is going into the next subject. We're going to talk about re reducing medication error, and then we're going to talk about um, re uh, medication um, types, um, you know, for different parts of the body. So I'll go back to your question, um, Athens. Uh, sorry. Can you tell me your name again? This is Jeremy. Jeremy. All right. Thank you, sir. I'm. I'm sorry. There's. I don't want you guys to think I don't care. It's just really hard to match names and emails when I see somebody that looks about that big on the camera. Um, so guys, I know you're f used to feeling like that, I, I, you know, but um, all right. So you, all right, you said, Jeremy, you asked um, about the um, use of methanol for the treat, excuse me, the use of ethanol for the treatment of ethylene glycol. All right, so remember when we were talking about agonists and competitive antagonists? <clears throat> we talked about agonists and antagonists, and then we talked about competitive antagonists. So what is an agonist? Was well, it something to happen? Yes, it binds to, it's a chemical, a substance that will bind to a cell and cause an effect to happen. What is an antagonist? So it binds to the cell, but prevents an action from happening or prevents another medication from going there. So an example would be opiates will bind to receptors to the muscarinic, um, excuse, the opioid receptors. <clears throat> in causing the uh, analgesia, but then you can give Narcan that'll bind to the same receptors and in a competitive manner, preventing the opioids from doing so, but also preventing the cells from doing anything or the receptors from doing anything. So that's an example there. Now, we understand that ethanol with ethyl alcohol, you know, the kind of alcohol we consume in drinks, will bind to receptors in our brain and alter our brain function, cause it, it, functioning as a depressant. It actually works as a stimulant in low doses, but then in higher doses, um, it becomes a depressant. So the if ethanol binds to the receptors, other things that look similar to it will also bind to those receptors. Ethylene glycol, ethyl, ethylene, and eth um, ethanol are very, very similar medicate uh, chemicals. Um, it, uh, you know, um, I, I'm not going to worry about drawing it out. It's not that big of a deal. But basically, one has um, an alcohol group attached to it, and the other has a sugar group attached to it. But it still has the same two-part uh, carbon structure, the ethyl um, structure. So. It, ethylene glycol will bind to the exact same receptors that ethanol will bind to. And incidentally, methanol will also bind to the same receptors that ethanol will bind to. But because the receptors like the two carbon structure that, of the ethyl group better than the ethyl with the um, sugar group or the um, single structure methanol is just a single carbon structure because it likes the two carbon structure better ethanol has a higher affinity to those receptors so if you have a patient who has consumed large quantities of ethylene glycol 
or methanol, both of which can be turned into formaldehyde and uh, other very toxic chemicals and can be lethal uh, in a very low dose. Um, if you had any of those conditions or situations, the administration of um, ethanol, regular alcohol, to that patient, it would bind in a competitive way to those receptors, preventing the methyl alcohol or the ethylene glycol from binding to those receptors, allowing the liver and the kidneys to eliminate it from the system faster. Not faster, just more efficiently, binding and giving it time. Now, incidentally, um, with for example, with methanol, methanol takes longer to be metabolized out of the system than ethanol does. Ethanol metabolizes re relatively rapidly, but methanol has a higher affinity. So if you are, uh, have ever experienced a very severe hangover, especially after drinking a homebrew of some sort or a less expensive um, alcohol, a lot of those have methanol in them inadvertently. And there's actually been cases where it was put in intentionally, but inadvertently they have uh, methanol in them. And since your body metabolized the ethanol overnight, let's say the next morning, the methanol has not been relieved, removed from your system yet. It's still there. It binds and creates the headache and the severe illness feelings and such like that associated with it, which is where the idea of, well, take another drink to have a nut that best cure for a hangover is another drink. Well, I'm not, that sounds very alcoholic-ish. I'm not advocating that. The theory there is if you ingest more ethanol, it will displace the methanol, allowing the methanol to be eliminated while the ethanol stays bound. Now, as long as you're only taking like one more shot or one more drink or whatever, it's a low enough quantity that you're not going to ingest a whole bunch more of the methanol to have that issue again and continue the problem, if, if you're following what I mean. The same thing can be effective for ethylene glycol. It allows the body to eliminate it. So for that reason, it is not uncommon for the the hospital to use ethanol in the IV form, very controlled dosing, to administer ethanol IV for methanol and uh, ethylene glycol poisonings. So yeah, doctor's like, well, you're uh, hungover, so you're, we're going to give you a, um, you have alcohol poisoning, so we're going to give you alcohol. So kind of makes, it's kind of funny, but they're two different types of alcohols. All right, so uh, did I answer your question, Jeremy? Do you have any further questions on that? Yeah, it was just, it just says it's all through metabolism. So I was just curious if the, the metabolism of the ethylene glycol was more detrimental to the body than the metabolism of the ethylene glycol. And it doesn't compete in that way so that it can just push out the ethylene without it interacting with your body as, as such. Read the, the read the question uh, in its entirety. Uh, what is the medication interaction that, utilize, that is utilized when the emergency department physician considers administration of some ethanol to a patient who has been poisoned due to drinking ethylene glycol and it's altered metabolism? What's the correct answer? Okay, altered met. It is, it, so what it's doing is by binding to the, the ethanol, displacing the ethylene glycol, it's altering the way the body can metabolize the ethylene glycol by allowing it to stay free floating in the system and be released that way. It's just, it's that replacement process that makes it available for the enzymes to break it down and mm -hmm. remove it. So that's where the altered metabolism comes from. All right, any other questions? Okay, let's go ahead and take a quick break here, um, you know, just a couple minutes or so, and then uh, we'll uh, get started in the next unit, or um, in the next section here. All right, so reducing medication errors. Um, there's a few of these. Uh, you've probably heard of the R's um, back, oops, sorry. Um, when I went through paramedic school, there were five R's. Then there were six in the next book I read. Now there's 10. So they just keep adding more. But uh, you know, when I went through medic school, it was right patient, right medication, right dose, right route, right time. And those 
uh, five right there made a lot of sense to me. I was like, oh, I totally get you. Um, they added right documentation and reporting. I'm like, I get it. I get it. Yeah, we got to, you know, write down that we gave the drug, drug and what we gave and what the response was and tell the next person when you pass off care, that kind of thing. Yeah, we need to do that. But um, now they're adding in this right patient assessment. Did you document that you did the right patient assessment? Well, to me, that should be documentation, but okay, let's clarify. Um, so let's start at the beginning and look at these rights. Right patient. Now, rarely do we have a circumstance where we have multiple patients. This is definitely an issue more common to the uh, hospital facility where a provider may have multiple patients um, at a time. We, <coughs> we don't normally have that issue, but right patient can still be an issue of, is this um, patient allergic to this medication? Will this, will this cause an, a problem for this patient? Um, is the patient pregnant and therefore not supposed to have this medication or something along those lines? So that's where your right patient. Is it safe for this patient to have this drug and does this patient have a condition that needs to be treated with this drug? You know, we don't just do drug, we don't just give medications just, oh, because we can. We do it specifically to treat symptoms. That's why I, I don't like these cardiac arrest protocols that are like, oh, yeah, at this point, you can go ahead and give Narcan or you can go ahead and give uh, sodium bicarb or whatever because you're not. You're not treating based on the assessment finding. You're treating based on, eh, you know, it won't hurt. No, we, don't, we should not be giving drugs because it won't hurt. All right, next one, right medication. Are you grabbing atropine and not um, atrovent, which would be a really dumb thing to confuse because they're completely different routes. But, you know, are you grabbing the atropine, not the adenocard, you know, the adenosine? You know that kind of a thing. Are you grabbing the uh, are you grabbing the sodium chloride and not the D10? Um, uh, so things things like that. Have you picked the right med? Are you certain it was? There was a scenario a couple of years ago here in the Greater Atlanta area. Um, started with an incident at Stone Mountain where a person was. I think it was a July Fourth event. Um, had a um, Hypoglo or um, a syncopal episode, uh, local first aid, e EMS standby crew, started an IV, started care, transferred care to an ALS ambulance. I think there was an ALS fire truck. I think that's who was doing the standby. Anyway, through the course of the situation, the patient went from a syncopal episode talking and pretty okay on scene to um, dead when they arrived at the hospital. And they were trying to say, oh, like, what the crap happened? Well, it turns out somewhere in all the confusion instead of spiking a bag of saline to administer to the patient somebody spiked a bag of lidocaine and they rapidly infused an entire bag of lidocaine into the patient which is like a gram of lidocaine instead of a bag of saline and instead of having fluid resuscitation the patient was poisoned with sodium channel blockers and died as a, as a result. So where did the problem go wrong? Whose fault was that? That's a medical legal issue. That's a totally different issue. But right now we're talking about like, well, lidocaine is a clear substance in a clear bag. Sodium chloride is a clear substance in a clear, clear bag. Do you have the right one in your hand? Do you have what you thought you had? So that's a, a big question. Um, all right, right dose. Did you calculate it right? Did you do the math right? Do you know your math? Did you reference it? Did you? Is it the right dose? Is it the right route? Are you doing it IV when you're supposed to, or is it supposed to be IM or IN or something else? You know that should be clear. For us, fortunately, we don't normally have a lot of issues on that. But you don't want to be going and given a medication IV that should only be given IM. And an example would be Epi one to one thousand. Epi one to one thousand is perfectly safe IM. It is very dangerous IV because of the rapid rate of absorption. And then the right time. Did you give it at the appropriate interval? Did you give it after the appropriate interventions or assessments? Um, did you not did you give it fast enough and not wait too long? You know, like an example would be don't give, don't wait forever for uh, an anti-epileptic like Versed on a seizing patient. Like they're seizing, 
give them the med, stop the seizure. Don't wait 15 minutes before you give it just because you wanted to see if the seizure would stop. Uh, that wouldn't be good. But another one would be, uh, let's say nitro. <laughs> I'd bring it up a lot. It is an incredible medication, but can also be dangerous. I make a personal rule for me, okay? This is not the rule, but for me, I don't give nitro unless I've run a 12 lead and have an IV established. I have seen too many times where a good, healthy, even high blood pressure dropped to crazy low just from giving one nitro. I want to run the 12 lead, find out what's going on. I want to give have the IV just in case their pressure starts to drop. Like that's just me. Now, most protocols will say you need to run the 12 lead first. Some say you need to run an IV, do an IV first. And the 12 lead's not important. In some ways it is and isn't, but patients will take nitro at home on their own without having had a um, 12 lead. So, you know, opinions, you know, just like buttholes. Everyone's got one. They all stink. Um, all right, so that's your timing. That's, and that's an example of timing. Now, documentation and reporting, you got to write it down. What was the correct dose? Was it clear what you were writing down? And did you report it to the oncoming staff? So like if you gave opiates during transport in the ambulance, make certain that you tell the receiving staff, I, yeah, I gave them this so that they know and they don't double them up. Assessment. This is saying, have you adequately checked the parts of their body that you need to as a result or after giving that meds? Like, so if you know that medication has a risk of dropping their blood pressure, did you check it? It has a risk of decreasing their heart, their respiratory rate. Did you check it? Or let's say its likelihood is it's going to reduce uh, wheezing. Well, did you listen? Did it reduce the wheezing? And did you record that you did that? All right, the other is the right to refuse. Now, this isn't a right for us. This is a right for the patient. The patient has the right to refuse. They can say, no, don't want it. What's going to make them say, no, I don't want it, or yes, I want it? What What is it they need to make that choice? Informed consent. Well, that is informed consent, but what do they need to make that choice? What is What do they need to be informed of? What the medication is going to do and the risk if they take it or don't take it. Yep. What is it we hope the medication will do? What is it that are side effects of the medication if they do take it? What is the uh, expected outcome if they don't take it? Yep. That is what it takes to get informed consent. All right. And then the right evaluation. Are we transporting them to the right location um, to be treated afterwards? Um, and then have they been educated? Have they been informed? This is how you do it. This is definitely a question that's going to be far more common to patients being prescribed routine medications, uh, daily prescription kind of things, not so much what we're dealing with. But those are out there. <clears throat> definitely know these R's. All right. So a nice thing is we don't often get verbal orders. We don't often get over the phone orders. Occasionally we will. We will call in or, you know, seeking medical control or whatever. When you receive it, you're writing down what the doctor tells you. It's like, yes, I am prescribing or she's saying, yep, you can get the refusal or don't get the refusal or give this med. You write it down and then you read it back. Okay, so I'm supposed to give this much med in this route. And they're like, yep. And I'm, okay, good. Definitely read that back. Repeat it back to them. Make certain that you understand and that it's clear. Um when you're going to give the medication in the back of the truck. You've been talking, oh, hey, I think this patient needs Zofran, blah, blah, blah. Well, you're about to get it. Call it out. I'm giving Zofran four milligrams. I'm giving Zofran eight milligrams. Make it clear, not just quietly to yourself. Say it out loud. Even if everybody else in the truck has absolutely no idea what it is you're talking about, it doesn't matter. You said it out loud, and that hearing it will often help clue you in like, wait a minute, no. Oh, oh this is oh, this is diphenhydramine. I needed the ondansetron. Oh crap, I've got the wrong vial. Like that's what will clue you in that you have a problem. So read, call out the med name, read it, say the dose. This is how much I'm getting. Um, label syringes, we don't normally have to do this too much because we don't often keep medication in multiple syringes. But it if you were to draw up several syringes, say like, okay, my meds are in the truck, I'm gonna draw them up and bring them in to give to this sedation patient or whatever. 
make certain that you've labeled those syringes so that there's no confusion as to which one's which. Um, like you'll see flight crews do this when they're going to do a rapid sequence intubation. This one's the automate. This one's the sucks. That kind of a thing. And it'll be labeled. Um, bring patients meds to the hospital. That way they don't have a confusion. There's different policies and procedures on this. I do a lot of this. Bring them with me. That way the staff can look at them. Sometimes the patient will, nope, they already got it in the system. All right, fine. Patients don't want you to take it. Fine. You know what? If I leave it at their house, there's less of a chance of it getting lost and a much less of a chance of them saying I stole it, which unfortunately has happened way too many times. Not to me. Nobody's ever accused me of stealing it, but it's happened in the industry way too many times. We talked about reference. Do you have a question? Is that a question or a cough? Oh. Okay. So we've talked about reliability of re your reference sources. Uh, you know, make certain that you're getting your doses from the right location. You're not getting some bad info on the dose. And then have your partner or have somebody else in the truck confirm it. You're like, look, I'm going to give Zofran four milligrams. This is um, two milligrams per milliliter. So here's two milliliters. Boom. I give the whole thing. Like, yep, sounds good. Your partner may not understand or know what that dose is, you know, what the dose for that med is or what that med does, but they know how to do math and they can be like, uh, dude, that's not four milliliters. That's, you know, two milliliters or, you know, or that something like that. Or like, dude, that's not two, that's four milliliters. Don't give the whole thing. That kind of a thing. Confirm the dose. Have somebody look over your shoulder. In the words of my dad, when we were doing construction projects, have somebody agree with you when you're wrong. So here's some common documentation errors. Again, not super concerning for us because we don't write things down or receive from another shift kind of a thing. And most stuff is p typed now, but never put the zero after the um, decimal. Unless there's another number after that zero, never have trailing zeros, never end with the zero. So if it's four milligrams, it's four. It's not 4.0 because 4.0 could look like 40 really easy. Same with the 0.8. Always have a leading zero um, in front of a de decimal. So it's 0 0.8, not 0.8, which sure looks like eight at a glance. So... Um, you can see some of these things, MSO4, MGSO4, you know, they're morphine or mag sulfates. Sub-Q could get confused with sublingual. Again, some of those not such a big concern simply because we, um, we don't do it as often. I've even seen subcutaneous written as SQ, not SC. Uh, so that might help too. But uh, again, it's not, um, we don't write things out like this as much but it is things to keep in mind. All right, so now we're gonna get into the body systems of the heart. This act, or excuse me, body systems and medications affecting them. It's actually not a very long segment. Um, so we'll do it after lunch and then start into our um, med administration after that. So let's go ahead and take lunch now and we're gonna to plan to come back at 12.50, 12.50 Eastern time. Any questions? I'll sit here for a minute if people have questions. Should we be doing an adult and pediatric dose on, on these uh, parts? Yes. 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 Yes, do the adult and pediatric dose. Um. clinicals when we start getting sheets for doing like checkoffs on stuff on the trucks or when you're doing I'm sorry I missed part of that when we do clinicals like when we have this upcoming lab day yeah. are we going to get to start doing skills on the truck or not yet after this lab day so your skills on the truck will only uh, start, well, are you talking about lab skills or are you talking about clinical skills? Yes, both, if you want to go through both. Okay. If you want to explain how that's going to work. So, um, 
All right, so let's talk about drugs that are going to affect the nervous system. There's a number of different ones. Now, what we're going to talk here is more specifically classifications, categories of drugs. I will cite specific um, examples, but this is not intended to be an exhaustive um, depiction of all of that, um, you know, of every, every drug that we will see. All right, so um, of course we know that there is a number of different chemical receptors through the body. We've talked about those. We've talked a little about alpha, beta, alpha one, beta two. Remember, I like to remember recall that uh, beta one is the, in the heart because there's one heart. Beta two is in the lungs because there's two lungs. Alpha receptors are in the arteries because alpha arteries, but they're in the vessels. Arteries are vessels, so they cause arterial constriction or vasoconstriction. All right, so here you can see what's going on. They use these little pictures. It's like, is it just me or do those look like like Obama? Like for some reason, those little faces always made me think of uh, Barack Obama. Um, but you can see how the alpha receptor that is both in the lungs and in the vessels, you can see that the receptor will fit. It's the little triangle. Whereas the beta receptor, there's in the lungs or in the a heart but also in the vessels and they do different things but only that type of chemical will respond to that uh, receptor to that type of receptor um, all right so you can see here we're talking about how a uh, drug um, will increase it so an alpha agent adrenergic Agonist, an alpha agonist will speed things up, speed up heart rate, speed up contraction, uh, such like that, uh, dilate the respiratory tract, and all, so on and so forth. But it will cause also um, can cause vasodilation in that sense. But the um, alpha properties that we will see what we will see is while beta properties cause vasodilation alpha will cause vasoconstriction but the vasoconstrictor uh receptors in the arteries are far more potent than the um beta receptors so the like if you give a patient epi where it has alpha and beta functions the beta function will do far more um did i say that no the alpha function will be more powerful and overcome the uh the dilation so you'll actually get the vasoconstriction from the epi so you yeah so this is just oversimplifying it i think or over explaining it at least all right so um yeah i already kind of talked about those so here's some examples uh neosinephrine um anybody recognize neosinephrine phenylephrine very common decongestant medication, like uh, um, Afrin, stuff like that. So it also is used for uh, blood pressure treatments and, you know, as a vasoconstrictor and such, but it has, it can be used for a decongestant. So dopamine is an alpha and a beta, depending on the dose. So that's the interesting thing about dopamine is in low doses like two to five micrograms per kilogram per minute, dopamine is going to work in the kidneys and retain fluid, reduce urine production. But when you go up to doses of like five to 12 micrograms per kilogram per minute, it's gonna cause increased contractility in the heart. But then when you go up to uh, say 12 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute, you're gonna have vasoconstriction. So it's gonna have beta properties in the lower doses, but it's gonna have alpha properties in the higher doses. You can see epi is gonna be both beta and alpha. It, it's only listing here under beta, but it's both um, beta and alpha at the same time. Albuterol, isoproterenol. We don't see isoproterenol very much, uh, mostly because it was way too powerful. Um, same with procainamide. These were drugs that are very effective at what they do, um, so much so that they can cause a lot of damage if, if used incorrectly.
All right, so blockers. We've talked about blockers many times. What this is showing you is the blocker doesn't activate the site. It doesn't fit in all the way. It does fit in enough, and it prevents you from um, from the actual agonist medication from binding. So, this is a silly depiction on uh, how that works. So. What we're, we would call that would be a sympatholytic. So there's a term, you might see parasympatholytic or parasympathomimetic, um, or a sympatholytic and a sympathetic, sympathetic or sympathomimetic. So what, what we're talking about here is lytic, all right? The, the suffix lytic, what does that mean? Macon. What does the suffix lytic mean? What did in the textbook last night that I cannot remember? Okay. Think of another word that has lytic at the end. Paralytic. paralytic. All right, well, what's a paralytic? Paralyzes you? You're paralyzed. So paralytic, lytic is to block, to paralyze, to prevent function. All right. Um, so a sympatholytic is going to be a sympathetic blocker. It's going to block the sympathetic nervous system. A parasympatholytic is going to block the parasympathetic nervous system. So that's when you hear the term, you see the lytic at the end, it's blocking that symptom. All right, so these would be beta adrenergic blockers. You can see beta blockers are going to make it harder for you to breathe. Um, they're actually going to cause the vaso or bronchial constriction or prevent the albuterol or the epi from getting in there and actually dilating the bronchioles. So a um, excuse me, a um, beta blocker medication can be really negative if a person has a history of asthma or has an allergic reaction you're trying to treat that allergic reaction the, that beta blocker can really get in the way on that one all right so another thing to talk about that it didn't bring up um okay i didn't get into the word here all right sympathomimetic all right so mimetic if you take just the last few uh the um Suffix there, mimetic. What does mimetic mean? Or what's another word it sounds like? Mimic. Yep. A mimetic is a mimic. It is doing the same thing. So a sympathomimetic will mimic or do the same thing that the sympathetic nervous system normally does. A parasympathomimetic is going to do the same thing that the parasympathetic nervous system is going to normally does. So that's that variation there. Um, so. All right. Um, all right. So sedative. Okay. So that's nervous system. That's talking sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. We talked about a few different drugs that will incur increase it, decrease it again. I guess we're not worried about doses right now. We're just talking about how that drug works and what things it'll do on the body. So were there any of those that I didn't? clearly explain as far as the individual drug you're like whoa wait wait i want to know more about that before i move on to the next airway you good conyers all right so 
airway medications. There's a lot of different airway medications, but when, or there's a lot of different air medications that you're going to think about here. But the interesting thing is we are talking about the airway, the passages, not necessarily breathing. So what medications are we going to do to keep a person breathing, keep an open airway? And you're like, wait, sedative hypnotics? Why? Well, if we have to sedate somebody in order to intubate them for RSI, we need to have a sedative hypnotic available. So Atomidate is an incredibly effective medication for that. Um, it's short acting, as you can see, five to eight minutes. I've actually seen eight minutes most often. But five to eight minutes, uh, as you can see, it starts working in 30 to 60 seconds, very quick onset from an IV administration. And it doesn't have a lot of issues um, otherwise, it doesn't affect a lot of other um, issues in the body, like drop their blood pressure, which is great for a trauma patient who may already have a low blood pressure. Um, so it's really um, useful for that. But notice it's only given as one dose. You can only give Atomidate once and then to initiate the sedation and then you maintain the sedation with another drug like Propofol or Versed or Ativan or something along those lines. Ketamine is another group, a uh, great medication that we're starting to see come back. Um, of course, I think it'll be a while before we all get it and we all see it, but it is becoming more con um common and accepted it is a excellent retrograde amnesic it will cause it you will not remember what happened to you while you were on ketamine and you don't even have to have a dose of ketamine strong enough to put you to sleep it can you could still be awake communicating functioning moving but then never remember it at all and a reason this is becoming well let me back this up First of all, ketamine is considered an airway or in the airway category because it is considered an anesthetic. Or, um, and an an used to be used in general anesthesia. It was used to sedate you for surgery. Like it, it can knock you out. Um, in smaller doses, it doesn't knock you out so hard and just keeps you, uh, creates the amnesia. Well, there were a, um, there was a big concern with it for a while because patients who would come out of general anesthesia from it under heavy doses would have what's called emergent terrors. They would become incredibly violent and aggressive as they came out of those terrors. Now, I have a couple of other opinions of what might have been going on, and I don't know if it's 100% ketamine's fault um, because those conditions weren't as commonly reported under recreational use, which is the other big issue with ketamine. It had a huge recreational following. The It was called Special K, Horse Tranquilizers, vit Vitamin K, things like that, because it was a very potent sedative hypnotic, both sedative and hypnotic, like tripping uh, kind of stuff. And there's some really crazy things that you can learn about with overdoses on ketamine and people whose drug experience, people using ketamine and never being the same afterwards, like um, quote unquote, never coming back uh, from it. There's some wild stuff out there that's well documented. So all of that together really concerned people. Um, so it was removed from the market. They stopped using it as a general anesthetic and it went over to veterinary completely. And that's where the horse tranquilizer concept came from. Um, but of course it'll still knock a person out. Now we're starting to see a comeback. A lot of people are like, I don't want veterinary medicine, horse tranquilizers. Okay. Well, that's fine enough, but it can make it so you don't remember the injury. You don't remember the pain and the suffering that followed. Um, and the reason this is coming about is they found that the majority of PTSD memories and issues are not the result of the incident and the pain, or excuse me, not the result of the initial injury, but a result of the pain during immediate care and treatment, whether that's transportation to the hospital or exams at the hospital or something like that. Through studies with pediatrics and in the military, that's what they found was that most PTSD was the result of that pain post-incident, not the actual moment of the injury. And so the thought here is if we can induce amnesia during the treatment process, plus it calms them down, relaxes them, it makes them very mellow. Um, 
We improve their general well-being and feeling during the incident, but then they'll have no memory of that pain so that it won't be able to haunt them and come back as PTSD. So, but you can see some of the issues here. Um, you can use it for maintaining blood pressure and heart rate, but it also causes ICP to go up, which for the most part isn't a big issue unless your patient has a head injury and then you don't want to use it. I know several departments here in the local West Georgia area, uh, west of Atlanta, are using it for elderly orthopedic injuries. So like hip fractures, pelvic fractures, dislocated hips, things like that. Very effectively for that. All right, benzos, again, we talked about sedating them with atomidate or ketamine, but then maintaining the sedation with benzos like Versed or Atrovent, or Atrovent, um, and things like that. It takes a lot of these meds. These meds are very effective for stopping a seizure. They're very effective for calming you down, like a tranquilizer of some sort, um, like anti for anti-anxiety. But it takes a lot of these meds to knock you out and maintain sedation. So that's a negative on this part. Um, also, a lot of them, nearly all of them, are pregnancy class D, meaning we know they can ca cause harm to the fetus. If I'm remembering correctly, it is of biggest concern during first trimester. It's not so much of a concern uh, later um, in pregnancy. All right, but let's say you give too much uh, Versed or Ativan, you too much of a benzo. What's that going to do? Well, those benzos are going to, sit, well, we said sedate them, We're trying to knock them out, put them unconscious but it can ultimately reduce their respiratory drive. Not the way an opiate does, but more in a, they're so sedated, they're not protecting their airway and they may not be breathing adequate. If they're not protecting their airway, kind of like the person with obstructive sleep apnea, their tongue's blocking their airway, they can't breathe adequately through it, but they're too asleep to wake up and know it. Another issue would be they are, um, more prone to vomit. In fact, the majority of the patients who are going to die from a benzodiazepine overdose, including something like Xanax, are going to die from vomiting and aspirating on their vomit. They suffocated in their own vomit while they were asleep. That's what's going to kill people. Very, It's very rarely the actual a toxicity of the benzo. So that's what we want to watch out for, maintaining those airways and such. But let's say we gave too much. Well, there's a couple of different options. First and foremost, what did I just say the biggest concern, and please answer this, what is the big concern of overdosing on a benzo? I just said it. Airway management. What is the first thing we get taught? Right. So if the patient's not maintaining their airway because we gave them too much of a sedative, while that is very irresponsible and should never be our modus operandi, that is not what we should be intending to do. All we have to do is maintain the airway. The oops, let's be careful here, is just maintain that airway. Keep it clear, keep it open, keep them oxygenating. There's no reason to reverse the effects. Now, if we're talking like this person has taken like three whole bottles of uh, Valium or, you know, Ativan pills or something, and they're going to, it could cause toxicity in their brain. Okay, that's a little bit of a different story. But most of the time, we're just going to maintain their airway and keep them breathing because they're quiet, they're calm, they're asleep. Yeah, we might have to sit there with our hands on them the whole time, holding that airway open or drop an OPA or an NPA, but we just maintain the airway, we're all good. There are some cases, though, where you would want to use flamazenil. Flamazenil is a chemical that reverses the effects. It is to uh, benzos what Narcan is to opiates. It will reverse the effect completely. But the problem is it's really, really effective. And most people who we are giving benzos to have been giving... Got, receiving benzos for quite a while. So whether this is a seizure patient who takes benzos or barbiturates on a daily basis to prevent seizures, or an anxiety patient who's dependent on Xanax or other um, anti-anxiety medications to keep func you know, for them to function normally, or whatever it happens to be, or maybe it's a junkie who um, abuses benzos somehow. Um, these patients, were we to give flamazenil to them, we would block all of the benzo receptors. We will prevent all effects of benzo in their body. And if they have been taking benzos long enough to become dependent on those benzos, now 
You've blocked them all, you've removed it, and it puts them into an immediate withdrawal scenario. Kind of like we talk about alcohol withdrawals and um, opiate withdrawals where they have seizures and sweating and tachycardia and can have a heart attack and have a really rough time of it. That's what we're talking about here. These people would go into full-blown seizures and withdrawals in a matter of minutes, and there's nothing that will stop the seizure because the only thing that we could give to stop seizures is more benzos, but we've already got flamazenil, also known as ramazicon, on board, and it's not going to stop it. So... <sighs> Be cautious with the use of a blocker like flamazenil. This is also one of the reasons to be very cautious with the dosing of Narcan. Used to be, oh, two milligrams of Narcan, boom, slam it. Okay, they're gonna puke, they're gonna get angry. Why, why are we gonna do that? Why are we going to put up with all that crap when all we could do, when all we needed to do was give like 0.4 milligrams of Narcan and call it good? And you know, okay, they're breathing, but they're still sleeping. Well, you know, don't have to listen to them lie now. <clears throat> All right, so these are also airway agents. These are your chemical paralytics. This is gonna be things like rocuronium, succinylcholine, vecuronium, pancuronium, so, so on and so forth. Succinylcholine is what's considered a depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent, depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. It will bind to the acetylcholine receptors, the nicotinic receptors at the muscle sites. We've talked a lot about acetylcholine in these receptors. We even saw the video where they were being activated. It will bind to those receptors, cause them to fire, cause the muscle to contract, and then remain bound without releasing, which means the muscle will not receive a second signal, so it will not contract again. So they will go flaccid in a matter of a few seconds. When they do this, the entire body will contract in a wave-like pattern very, very quickly as, as each signal gets, or each muscle gets activated. And it is quite impressive because they're, they get stiff. Sometimes it looks a little like a seizure, but it's all the muscles contracting at the same time. And then they go completely flaccid. And normally what they'll do, the like flight crews or people doing RSI will watch the jaws. When did the jaw become relaxed again? And then you know it's done its job. There's the blood. Here's normal acetylcholine causes the muscle to fire and then gets reabsorbed and then gets fired again. Well, here we have a blocking neuromuscular blocking agent and it's binding and staying bound to these receptors, preventing the acetylcholine from causing um, an action. Now, <coughs> succinylcholine lasts about eight minutes. It's very short. It was it's used a lot for in our RSI because it's not going to be there for very long. Uh, although a lot of places are moving away from it, they're wanting to use things like Rock or Vec. Something's going to keep them paralyzed for a while because most of the time, if we're uh, intubating somebody, we're not intubating them for fi five minutes or eight minutes. We're going to have them intubated at least for a couple hours, if not a couple of days. So why why give them something small? Give them the rock. Give them 45 minutes, an hour and a half worth of paralytic para paralysis, and then you don't have to worry about them bucking the tube or moving during a CT or an x-ray or something like that. Uh, the big issue with that, or excuse me, the big thing to keep in mind with this, though, is that a paralytic is not a sedative. A paralytic will stop muscle function, but it in no way inhibits brain function. So they have to be given in concert with each other. You have to give the sedative first and then the paralytic. If you give the paralytic first and not the sedative, the person will be completely paralyzed, including their diaphragm, completely unable to move or breathe, and 100% conscious and alert of what's going on, at least for the next four minutes until they pass out from suffocation. But you have to sedate them first. You have to maintain that airway, you have to maintain that breathing, and then maintain that sedation for the duration of the paralysis. Otherwise, that's straight up torture. And if you ever want to wonder why we used to do RSI on the trucks and now we don't see it very often, it was because of this right here. And dickhead paramedics thinking well this patient's a jerk and they pissed me off because they're drunk or whatever and who cares they're drunk they're not going to remember it so i'm just going to rsi them and they would not give the sedative they would just give the paralytic and the patient was drunk or you know altered some way but still aware and still cognitive and still remember and that's like straight up torture
and that is not what we're about here. All right, so because of the muscle contraction, it can cause the hyperkalemia. It can release a lot of potassium from all the muscles because every muscle cell is firing at the same time. It can cause bradycardia because it stiffens the muscles in the neck, which cause a vagus nerve stimulation and cause the heart rate to go down. Um, and then the malignant hyperthermia is another big one to worry about because it can create an internal body temp going up as the muscles contract and increase their body temp. And... Um, uh, word I'm looking for um, metabolism all right Zemeron which is rocuronium or vecuronium which is norcuron these are several other medications um, when it says short duration that's I think it's like 30 45 minutes whereas vec is like uh, 90 minutes I think up to 90 minutes so when these bind, they work a lot like sex does, except they don't cause the fasciculation. They bind to the receptor without tri triggering the muscle contraction, and that's it. They just straight up bind, prevent muscle contraction, and the patient goes flaccid. Again, you must sedate them first. Now, occasionally we will use these class of meds, and we'll see more about them in a little bit, but these are often used for maintaining airway, especially your corticosteroids and such in order to relieve swelling in the throat, like after a uh, allergic reaction. Uh, but you can also use bronchodilators like albuterol, or you can use epinephrine, which is a uh, does all of those things. Um, epi can be inhaled as a racemic epi, or it can be injected, or it can be done IM. All right, so here we go. Respiratory management. This is beta agonist. What does agonist mean? With the receptor, you make it yep, activating, causing a ha causing a reaction, causing something to happen. So, what is a common beta agonist that we would use for uh, respiratory management? Albuterol. Albuterol. It is selective beta two. It is supposed to work on the beta two receptors and not as much on the beta one. So, um, but it will have an effect. It. Um, there can be some heart rate uh, effect as well, but it is prim predominantly a beta-2 uh, agonist. All right, so you see levobuterol, which is very similar, but it just doesn't have as much beta-1 properties. Um, Terbutaline and epinephrine are also good beta agonists. Um, however, they both have alpha functions as well. They're not select, and they're beta-1 and 2. Not They are not selective. All right, so uh, muconitic bronchodilator medications. All right, ipitropium bromide is in a class of medications known as anticholinergic. It's putting it in here in mucokinetic, um, which is reducing mucus. Uh, it really, atropin, atrovent, very similar to atropine, um, kind of has that same class there. It causes a decrease in mucus production, so it's really great for CHF patients. Um, not C I said CHF, COPD. It's very great uh, for COPD patients. It can help with asthma um, and sometimes in CHF as well. But it reduces the third spacing of fluid in the vas vasodilation in the lungs um, and reduces that swelling so that the tissue isn't as swollen and therefore not leaking as much. So that's how it will dry the lungs out. All right, I mentioned corticosteroids last time, or in the last, in the part about airway as far as reducing inflammation. Corticosteroids uh, like solimedrol, decadron, um, prednisone, uh, cortisol, uh, think, cortisone, things like this, these are used, can be used for any part of the body to reduce the inflammation. That's why they're like, oh, my knee hurts. Okay, we'll give you a steroid shot. Well, actually the steroid shot didn't do anything to fix the knee. All it did is prevented the body from having the normal inflammatory response, which means now your knee isn't as swollen. And because it's not as swollen, it doesn't hurt as much. That's why it doesn't hurt. But the damage, whether that's a torn stretched ligament, torn meniscus, whatever it happens to be, that damage is still there. You didn't 
fix it. This is why if you've ever heard of it happening amongst high school students, it's a big no-no is my understanding now. But uh, students would get a, um, they would be like, oh, I'm, you know, whatever. Uh, my knee hurt, football player, you know, high school football player. I'm supposed to go to college on a scholarship, yada, yada. My knee hurt. Well, here, we'll let you finish the game. Give you a, a, a steroid injection in your knee. Pain goes away. I'm good to go. But they keep on playing, and they keep on tearing up that tissue. We're going to use it on the other side of the body, in the lungs, to reduce that swelling so that we can allow airflow to go through. Because while the swelling might be there for treatment, it's kind of got to have airflow or it don't matter if it gets treated or not. So we use it to maintain that airflow. Now it's important to remember that because it's an immunosuppressant, because it's an anti-inflammatory, it will make you more susceptible to get sick. So you want to be very cautious with the dosing on this. You don't want to give the patient too much and you don't want them to be on it for a long period of time. All right, singular, we don't see these. Uh, very much in the pre-hospital environment. These are patient uh, medications patients are going to use in a long time. The leukotriene receptor antagonists, these block leukotriene effects, kind of like an antihistamine blocks histamine effects. So singular, this is long-term asthma or COPD. All right, moving into the heart. So there's a number of different medications that we're going to come across with the cardiac system the majority of them are intended to fix arrhythmias so an arrhythmia is an abnormal rhythm or a dysrhythmia is an unhealthy rhythm excuse me arrhythmia not necessarily abnormal but abs it's missing the rhythm the rhythm is off so a dysrhythmia is that in an unhealthy way um so it, most of them are going to work by blocking channels. And the Vaughn Williams classification, it's one through four. There is some literature will say a fifth classification, but the fifth classification is a generic like all other catch-alls. So that's why some places say it's one through four, others say it's one through five. But um, Vaughn Williams classification groups will discuss the different channels that are being blocked. So... Uh, remember, if we talked about this the other day in patho, or excuse me, in A and P, you know what? This is going to get a little tough. This is going to get a little nerdy. So before we dive into this, go ahead, take a quick break, and uh, stretch your legs and come back ready to learn. I don't think we got many people back in class yet. <laughs> no, we don't seem to. But we got things to do, places to be. So let's get started. All right, so we can see here, there's the five phases of cardiac cell activity. Cardiac cycle, these were the phases that we talked about with the sodium channels, and the ion, sodium and potassium exchange, and the pumps. But let, and so let me show you this. Um, here you can see I've drew, drawn out the uh, curve, more or less, the action potential curve. And this shows the thresholds. Uh, there, this is about negative nine, oops, 90. This is about positive 30. And this is about positive 25 or so. All right. Um, and then this is a negative 70. That's your threshold limit. Okay, so um, this is all a matter of millivolts on these um, right here. Now, um, when we were talking about this, we see that the negative, or at four, um, where's my mouse? There it is. All right, so you guys can see my mouse? No. Nope, you can't. Okay, never mind. All right, so down there in phase four, cell activity is at rest. Nothing's happening. Everything's at complete rest. And then in phase zero, there is a massive influx of sodium ions. The sodium is f rushing into the cell, causing, uh, prepping for the depolarization. And that's where we have that big electron shift and the polarity shift. Then and in phase one, your sodium 
influx is slowing down or stopped and so it's starting to get pumped back out um but as the sodium was coming in the potassium is starting to move out so now it's exchanging and you're getting that little bit of a drop there so the sodium influx has gone down but the potassium outflow has gone up so the potassium going out wants this action potential to go down but the sodium coming in wants it to go up so it would look <coughs> it would go in somewhat like this kind of a direction where this it would want it to keep going with the sodium but the potassium leaving wants it to go like this and so instead we get this black line here where it runs in the middle well it'll only run that way for a while and so we call that phase two and that's where calcium's coming in but potassium is still leaving eventually calcium has done its job and is not bypassing the potassium and so it starts to fall off the curve over here and when you start to fall off that curve in that relative reactor refractory period the some of those potassium and sodium channels are starting to change direction and then all of a sudden all the sodium gets pumped out really fast and potassium's flowing in very fast and it resets back to the resting phase back into phase four again and so that's the whole potential but so you notice this whole process is a matter of sodium moving in and out potassium moving in and out and calcium moving in and out so for that reason go back to our powerpoint so for that reason we see a um that the von um von wildermann um classification of why can I not think? All right, that's why the classification of antidysrhythmics are going to be based on the ions that they block or the channels that they block. Now, it doesn't say a heat. Oh, there, I skipped it. Apparently, I went too far. So there's that drawing that I tried to draw um, but didn't have some words on it. All right, so class one, antidysrhythmics. This is going to slow sodium. So if you slow sodium flow, you're going to affect the class uh this zero phase right here in the middle all right at the beginning that sharp upstroke here that's what gets um affected if you have a sodium channel but it can also affect this period in this area right here, um right through there in the curve in that phase one area all right, so a, um, by slowing the movement, this could be so, uh, procainamide or lidocaine, both of them will do it, but by slowing those channels, blocking the sodium, you make it less likely to receive stimulation. One of the things that I like to think of, explain it as, is we're all familiar with how uh, what they do. If you're gonna get stitches, they give you an injection of lidocaine, you're gonna get a tooth pulled, they give you some lidocaine to numb, numb it up. Well, when a person, uh, when you give lidocaine to a heart, that lidocaine is going to um, numb the lower parts portions of the heart causing it to do its um i don't know why this thing decides when it does and doesn't want to work makes no sense but it'll work in or um, it'll numb down here making it harder for the signal to start so if the person is prone to abnormal heart rhythms has irritated heart muscle or something you stop that sodium from flowing you're going to make it harder for that cell to beat which makes it less likely to go into v-fib or v-tac because it gets rid of that abnormal focus that abnormal function now <clears throat> That's class ones, class twos. Class twos are beta blockers. Now, where what do we know about betas? They can relax muscle. Okay, they can relax muscle. They can do a number of different things. What else can they do? Well, let's say they, they relax muscle, yes, but how does this 
what what is the effect of that? Dilation, dilation, bronchial tubes and veins. Yep. So they'll dilate the bronchial tubes, dilate the veins. They'll. But what do they do to the heart? So beta receptors will increase heart rate and contractility, whereas alpha receptors will not, or excuse me, while, whereas beta blockers will do the opposite of that. They will decrease contractility, they will decrease uh, cardiac rate and function, and they will play a huge role in reducing uh, cardiac output. So that's why beta blockers are a very common blood pressure medication. Because by preventing the uh, heart from beating hard and fast, it can lower blood pressure. Lowers cardiac output. But this will make it so the patient is um, more susceptible to allergic reactions or at least less responsive to treatment for those conditions. So metoprolol is a very common um, beta blocker some of you probably carry it on your truck all right so class three class threes are going to be uh calcium channel blockers these antidysrhythmics will prolong the refractory period so let me go back to there so in phase two where that during that plateau if you if the cl class three antiarrhythmics are going to slow calcium movement Phase two is where calcium is flowing in and potassium is flowing out. If it takes longer to get the calcium into the cell that you need, it will take longer for the cell in phase two. So it slows the heart contraction down. If you slow the contraction length down, you increase the amount of time before it can contract again, meaning you're less likely to have rapid contractions after a calcium channel blocker. That's why we can use calcium channel blockers like, oop, there it is right there, amiodarone. Um, golly day, I cannot believe I did that. It's cal Class 4 is calcium channel, class 3 is potassium, all right? Potassium channel blockers. So it's the same phase, all right? It's just a different reason. I am so sorry. Phase 2. Still in phase 2, in that plateau region there, Potassium channel blockers, the potassium is leaving the cell, right? I was trying to say it earlier. Potassium leaves the cell during phase two. That's what maintains that um, plateau. Well, if you slow the release of potassium, you will, again, take longer for the potassium, excuse me, for the cell to reset, for it to be able to fire again. So amiodarone uh, is going to do that. The... Um, Sodalol, uh, again, not not super common. It's an oral med that people will take at home, but not we don't see it very often. The amiodarone, though, interesting thing about amiodarone specifically, while it is considered a class three and it is a potassium channel blocker, it actually has beta and um, sodium functions as well. It'll block beta and sodium receptor um, channels as well, not just potassium. So it is something to uh, remember um, that it does a lot, but it is primarily going to block the potassium flow. All right, calcium channel blockers. I already kind of talked about it. These are class four. Again, they're at class uh, phase two of your heart contraction, um, of the cell depolarization, I mean. By blocking calcium flow, it makes the muscle work longer. It If you can't get enough calcium in there to cause the contraction, it's gonna take longer for the contraction to happen, which is gonna slow the heart rate down, which means you can't have super rapid heart rates. This is why Cardizem, a very common and powerful um, calcium channel blocker, is used to treat arrhythmias like AFib and A-flutter, because you can, by slowing the contraction time, taking longer, less contractions can happen per minute, you can get rid of, you can treat things like AFib RVR, rapid ventricular response, so very fast AFibs. All right, uh, verapamil, cardizem, deltiazem. We don't see verapamil again. It, it's, it's an excellent drug. It's super powerful, which means it can do a lot of damage if you give it wrong.
All right, so now we're into the unnamed class, or the class five. Class five, sometimes called miscellaneous, sometimes just whatever, it's the catch-all. These are other antiarrhythmics that we're gonna use for patients, um, but are uh, not fitting into sodium, beta, potassium, or calcium. So adenosine is one of the, is the first one they mentioned here. Adenosine is a, so, all right, I say adenosine, what do you think? What hits your mind? Say it again. SVT. SVT, okay, so you're thinking the drug adenosine is used to treat SVT. Very true. Yes, it is. Um, anything else that we've learned about or talked about that sounds like adenosine or makes you think uh, you think of when you hear adenosine? Triphosphate. Yes, sir. Adenosine triphosphate, ATP. Adenosine, the medication, is very much the same chemical that is needed to make ATP. So it can be used and um, very quickly by the cells, it, and it basically produces a whole lot of ATP in that cell. And remember, if um, when we were looking at muscle function, if a cell is depolarized, it needs that ATP to keep it in that depolarized state. It's the ATP that is doing the um, helping the contraction happen with the muscle cells. So if you dump a whole bunch of ATP into the heart and it contracts and stays contracted for a longer time, then you're going to um, slow that conduction by just saying, okay, the, the, the cells the cells stopped. No, nothing can happen because the cell is still contracted. It's in that absolute refractory. It will not reset because everything is still functioning. You know, it's still at depolarization. So that's why we use adenosine to treat SVT. It goes straight to the AV node and causes all of the cells in the AV node to contract and fire. And while they're in their contraction fire state and maintained in that contraction state, they can't receive any more signals. They're absolute refractory. And so any additional rapid signal that was coming too soon will get interrupted. It'll hit it and not, just nothing happens because the AV node is completely contracted and not receiving any work orders. Nothing else will happen until it relaxes and then it allows the SA node to take over and restore the normal function again instead of being that boom, 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 boom. It can go back to the normal rate. Make sense? Am I putting you to sleep, Bryce? No, it's because I didn't sleep all last night. No, I understand. I sympathize. It's okay. I appreciate you standing up. All right. Uh, it's talking about rapid onset here. Yeah, because adenosine... Uh, is used by all the cells it has to be pushed very rapidly it its duration of function is short although its half-life is rather long the issue is um, it can be used up and metabolized so quickly so that's why we do a large proximal IV and rapid push with a rapid bolus behind it try to squeeze it into the heart really quick all right so eight um alpha adrenergic receptor antagonists these are alpha blockers okay these are used to treat hypertension um high, um, high blood pressure enlarged prostates things like that so these are going to cause um vasodilation in especially in the arteries catapress was experimented for a little while to see if it would work and found to be very fun effective in helping the treatment of emergency chf situations so instead of putting nitro under their tongue or um, lasix in their blood you could put catapress under their tongue and it seemed to be very effective at um, helping with the treatment by dilating the respiratory arteries out and reducing that pulmonary pressure the blood pressure in the lungs. All right, ACE inhibitors is another, uh, this is not an antiarrhythmic. This is a um, blood pressure medication, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE, A-C-E, angiotensin converting enzyme. Now, if you remember from my talk on the RAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, you know, the way the kidneys function to retain fluid uh, so when you're dehydrated, well, 
Angiotensin converting enzyme converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which then stimulates the release of aldosterone, which then says retain water. Well, if you have an ACE inhibitor, you can't make angiotensin 2, which means you can't make aldosterone, which means you can't retain the water, which means the water just gets urinated out. So that'll dehydrate you. That's why one of the very common causes or common side effects of angio, um, ACE inhibitors like in lisinopril is a dry cough. People are like, oh, I have a dry cough. Well, it's probably because you weren't hypertensive due to being oh, um, too much water in your blood. Now, the um, side effects are life-threatening angioedema. Well, while I can't fully explain the details here, the unique thing with ACE inhibitors is they will cause the fluid shift into the facial uh, tissue, like the tongue, the mouth, um, but predominantly the tongue. And the tongue, there's a picture on page 649 in your textbook that shows extreme angioedema. And you can notice that her face is not swollen. Her lips are not swollen. Her tongue is swollen. Now that tongue is so swollen. And if you want to look at it, 649, that tongue is so swollen that she would lose that airway. She has no oral airway. And if it was continuing to the swell to the posterior of her throat, it would occlude the airway back there. So that could be a real medical emergency. And this isn't a... Um, situation that uh, antihistamines are necessarily going to fix. I know somebody was asking me the other day about it and said that they'd had a patient with it, but the patient had no history of an ACE inhibitor or of taking lisinopril. Now, I would be curious if there were any other ACE inhibitors that they were taking, and I couldn't name all of them. Nobody's expecting you to memorize all the ACE inhibitors right now. But I think you should recognize at least uh, and lisinopril simply because it's so common. All right, so atropine, another cardiac medication, atropine anticholinergic, it will bind to the acetylcholine receptors in the heart. Now, earlier I mentioned that acetylcholine receptors are on the muscles and our skeletal muscles and cause contraction. Well, because the heart is uh, voluntary, in, or excuse me, involuntary and does not need a nerve signal to fire, it's going to fire on its own, the acetylcholine receptors in the heart do the opposite. Instead of causing them to contract, it prevents contraction. So if the vagus nerve, which is a cranial nerve, runs down to our heart, is activated and releases acetylcholine, it binds to the SA node and prevents the SA node from firing at a normal rate. This would cause your bradycardia to be induced, so heart rate's less than 60. Uh, a few years ago, there was a video floating around Facebook of an EMT at a station hooked up to a cardiac monitor. You can see the strip going on the four lead. And they had a big old bowl of ice water and they put their face completely into the bowl of ice water. And you can see their heart rate go down, demonstrating the vagal effect and, you know, vagaling down how the, the vagus nerve stimulation dropped to heart rate. You can do the same thing by rubbing the carotid arteries. Um, applying pressure to them or something, but then you risk breaking off arthrosclerotic plaque that may or may not be there. Oh gosh, it was seven years, six, seven years ago, there was the um, uh, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis ice bucket challenge where there, people were trying to donate and raise money for um, ALS research. And there were circumstances where people were passing out and having a syncopal episode after having the ice water dumped down their back. This was an example of a vagal effect. They were vagaling down from the cold ice water. What you would do in a circumstance like this is give atropine if it was a continuous vagal. You give atropine, it binds to the same receptors, blocks the acetylcholine, and allows the heart to return to its normal rate. It doesn't speed it up. It just prevents the slowdown. So if you were to compare this to a car, if you're driving in your car and all of a sudden you start standing on the brake, that's the acetylcholine slowing you down. You're standing on the brake. You take your foot off the brake, that's atropine removing the acetylcholine and allowing you to return to the speed. It isn't until you hit the accelerator that you're going to start speeding up again, but you're going to stop slowing down as much if you take your foot off the brake. And that's what atropine does for our heart. It takes the foot off the brake. It stops it from being slowed down. It allows it to run at its normal rate again. So we will use that and we'll get into that more later on. Just this is intended to be a very introductory explanation of these types of medications.
Now, if acetylcholine slows the heart down and atropine removes the effects of taking your foot off the brake, catecholamines like epinephrine, dopamine, norepinephrine, albuterol, tabutaline, these are all various catecholamines and sapathomimetics. These are like putting your foot on the gas. You put these in the system, everything in the heart's going to speed up. Higher rate, higher contractility, higher force, more rapid conduction, better vasoconstriction, so on and so forth, higher blood pressure, boom, 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 stronger, faster, higher, whatever you want, however you want to remember it. So, these are medications very similar to amphetamines. They fit in the same category. These are stimulants of the sympathetic nervous system. This is why you can see phenylephrine again. Amphetamines, albuterol, phenylephrine, and cocaine. They're all in the same category here. Phenylephrine, commonly sold as uh, afrin nasal spray. This is why people can get addicted to Afrin nasal spray because it is, in effect, a stimulant like methamphetamines are. Now, it's not as potent, it's not as damaging and dangerous by any means, but it still can be addictive. All right, so we already mentioned epinephrine several different times. All right, so nor norepinephrine. If you might remember, I used in a uh, back in patho, which was only a couple weeks ago. I used an example where I described the difference between when your body uses norepinephrine and when your body uses epinephrine. What was that example? What was that um, analogy I used or description? Golden Triangle. Y'all being quiet again. Oh, do you guys... Is Jonathan not there to uh, unmute you? No, sorry. I need to go. That's all right. Slacker. <laughs> all right. So what was... The, so y'all together individual whoever's got it what was the example i used to explain the difference on how our body needs norepinephrine versus when it needs epinephrine it was a couple weeks ago Remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so any of the other sites remember? Do what? When you were talking about the spider? Uh, might have been. I might have used a spider as one of the examples. Yeah, I used a couple of different examples, but I said so. Norepinephrine is what your body needs uses when it needs a little bit increase in blood flow and a little bit increase of heart rate. So if you're trying to carry, you get back to your apartment complex and you're trying to carry your bags of groceries up the stairs, norepinephrine is going to be put into your bloodstream in order to increase that response, to respond to that stress as you go up the stairs and, hurt, and increase your heart rate. But you get to the top of the stairs and there's some freako top of the stairs with a knife standing there waiting for you. Now you're going to freak out, you're going to FTFO, and epinephrine is going to be dumped in your body, and now you're ready to run. So norepi is the low response that handles the day-to-day, moment-to-moment, let's increase heart rate a little bit. But epinephrine is the big guns response when you have the complete fight-or-flight uh, syndrome going on. We can use norepinephrine, also known as levofed, as a uh, vasoconstrictor to increase contractility and constrict the vessels to improve blood pressure. So it is um, a, it's used to improve blood pressure just like dopamine or an epidrip would. 
And I just said dopamine. I mentioned it earlier how it has several different functions. Now, dobutamine, as you can see, it's synthetic. It's very much like dopamine, similar in dosing. However, it's um, it's more specific with less side effects. It's um, it doesn't have the the renal function and fo focuses more in the heart and the vessels. Uh, but we don't see it pre-hospital very often. Milrinone, another very powerful drug, still used quite a bit in the hospital, but we don't see it in the um, pre-hospital environment. As you can see, given as an IV bolus to improve heart rate and cardiac output. And I've already talked about this one several times, so not really gonna get into it anymore. Um, all right, so Digitalis. Digitalis is a medication that comes from plants originally, and you'll, you may have heard it also called Digoxin. Uh, is it, it's another name for it. But Digitalis comes from the foxglove plant. So if you've ever been at your uh, pharmacy, health food section, or uh, supplement section, you'll see foxglove uh, herb being sold as a heart healthy or for for your heart type thing well what it does is you see it improves, improves cardiac output slows conduction through the av nodes so if you're susceptible to afib it's really good at controlling afib and preventing you from having a really rapid ventricular rate but it beats harder when it does so so it has some good effects well if you get too much of it now your heart rate is too slow but also too strong which when I, as you can see, has problems. This is one of the reasons that you should always ch check with your farm, I'm not pharmacist, your doctor before you start taking a nutritional supplement along with medications. Because like, let's say, granny's got AFib, doctor prescribes her some uh, digitalis or some digoxin is the name of the med, just pre prescribes her digoxin to treat her AFib. She goes to her canasta game or, you know, her bridge club. And one of the other um, Q-tips there says, oh, honey, you don't need that. Here, you just take this. This is what I take, man. It works great. My heart feels good. And what she does, she goes and gets herself some foxgloves. She starts popping foxgloves and the digitalis. Good doctor said you got to take the digoxin. Next thing she knows, she's passed out on the floor because her heart rate's too slow because the medication and the herb supplement were doing the same thing and caused an overdose. So we can see digitalis with a lot of different reactions. Now, digitalis effects, it will change the EKG. And we'll get into that in cardiology. We're not doing that today, but we can actually look for digitalis effect and find out if, and notice if they've overdosed intentionally or unintentionally on that med. All right, so these are some medications that we may see that are also cardiac, but these are vasodilators. So we treat hypertension and things like that. The most common one would be nitroglycerin. I've said it over and over again, nitrospid, nitrostat, whether it's sublingual, IV, or transdermal. Uh, sodium nitroprusside, there you go. That's an IV, don't see that a whole lot um pre-hospital um it's required most of these require a pump hydralazine again don't see it in the we don't normally see it in our drug boxes but a lot of our patients are on it on a day-to-day -day basis and it's very common for them to receive at the er um, as soon as we arrive especially when they're um, ha having a hypertensive emergency All right, I am. Lo this is a newer drug to this textbook, and I am not as familiar with this one. But we are in the category of drugs that are going to affect blood clotting. So, like we talked about earlier, aspirin is going to. Oops, uh, aspirin's one that will fit into that category by smoothing out the platelets. You might get heparins or something like that that are are Lovenox that will break prevent clots from forming and things like that. Diuretics, I went over uh, Lasix when we were talking about the kidney function, but also you could go with um, Manitol, which is a 
uh, osmotic diuretic again pulls water out of the cells into the bloodstream which then goes to the kidneys and is urinated out lasix works directly in the lupa henle it prevents the reabsorption of potassium into the body you know pulling it out of the filtrate stops that process so the potassium stays in the filtrate and then the water stays in the filtrate which means the patient produces a lot more urine but the side effect what did i say the big problem with the use of lasix pre-hospital is what what happens after they've produced that urine What, uh, okay, so they produce the urine. What's their electrolyte issue? When you increase the kidney function, then it increases the electrolytes Which one? Is it the sodium? It does have some effect on the sodium, but it predominantly is working on potassium. So it has a big effect on potassium. But the real concern with that is when the potassium levels in the blood drop and potassium starts leaving the cells to try to balance between the blood and the cells, water leaves the cells and enters the bloodstream, causing a dehydration of the cells. And then in order to fix that, it's going to take quite a, amount, quite a bit of time. All right, so these are a list of various f common um, uh, beta, um, antihypertensive medications. What I would recommend is that you notice on these lists how most of the d drugs will have a very similar end, like catapril, enalapril, lisinopril. Um, you know, that's those are all ACE inhibitors. Or you go over here to your... Um, cholesterol lowering drugs they're all going to end in statin or your beta blockers this is your labetalol your metoprolol and things like that um, so notice how they're going to have that similarity of name and then kind of learn what that stem what that um, suffix indicates so you can recognize so you may not know all the names of all of these prescription meds which i'm not expecting you to do but if you can recognize the prefix or the suffix on it uh then you'll you'll kind of get an idea of what it's doing and be able to figure out what's going on all right so um i already mentioned um well, all right, we didn't talk about this. This is blood product administration. These are drugs that we will administer. Patients will, um, in some cases, we can give um, blood products, whether that's whole blood or um, plasma, platelets, something like that. Not as common, so I'm not going to get into it. We don't do type specific, even in the few areas that I've seen where blood is blood products are administered in the pre-hospital environment. They're not typing; they're uh, very generic, like universal donor stuff, <clears throat> type O blood. All right, um, yeah. All right, so you can have packed red blood. You know, I'm, you guys can read on that. That's not a super heavy, important area here, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But you got packed red blood cells, you got fresh frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate, you got platelets, and you got whole blood. Um, all right, transistemic acid. I brought this up the other day. It's a very unique drug. It's got a lot of studies going on with it. They're trying to find out if it will improve the major trauma patients by reducing um, bleeding and improved clotting. Um, it's been used for years for the treatment of severe uh, menstrual-related bleeding um, and with a lot of uh, benefit. Again, this is the current recommendation. It's still being studied. The question is, does it improve outcomes? Well, the problem is you're giving it to patients that were already dying. So, you know, knowing whether they did or didn't die is really tough. Or knowing whether they did or didn't benefit from it can be rather difficult. 
All right, talked about heparin and Lovenox. What these do is they prevent clot formation. They prevent the fibrin from um, solidifying clots. Um, patients on these will bleed more, but they will not break down the clots they already had. Um, same with Coumadin. Again, not going to break down the clots they already have. Um, heparin and Lovenox are a gentler med. They're less aggressive. Coumadin is a very powerful med uh, and can be uh, damaging um, in an overdose very quickly. Uh, in fact, some in the past, uh, lower doses of Coumadin have been used as rat poison um, because it would cause the rats to bleed out on the inside. All right, antiplatelet, blah, 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 aspirin, Plavix, these are all um, ones that we'll see very, and I kind of already talked about how they bind to the platelets, smooth them out, prevent them from um, um, forming clots or getting stuck. Now, fibrinolytics, there are places in the country where paramedics will give these, especially in the north, um, the Midwest, northern Midwest, uh, you know, the Dakotas and Nebraska areas and all that, where you might be three hours from a stroke center or any hospital whatsoever, paramedics may carry a um, fibrinolytics on the truck. So if the patient meets all the indications for a stroke screen, well, we put fibrinolytics on board, cross our fingers and hope it wasn't a bleed. Um, but it is a thing that we can do. Now, this is a medication that will break all um, clots. So not just the one that you wanted broken down. It will break them all down. Now, fortunately, here in the Atlanta area, and I'm really curious, Golden Triangle, listen to this. If I want to know if this is going on out your way. But here in the Atlanta area, our stroke centers have started a process of invasive stroke treatment, stroke care, where they do the equivalent of a cardiac catheterization on the brain. So they can go in, remove the th clots, or bust up the clot directly into the brain. Whereas previously, a patient would just be given a, a dose of fibrinolytics through an IV and hope for the best. Now they're doing this surgery and go rotor root the clot out of the brain or um, thromb thrombolytic it out of the brain. And what they'll do is they'll dose a very small amount of um, of the thrombolytic right at the clot in the brain. So have you guys heard of anything like that out your way? Yeah, they're doing that, um, mostly the major strokes, and they're like in Jackson. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so opiates. Tell me about opiates. You guys tell me about opiates. And I don't want to hear they're good, okay? We know that. You beat me by two seconds, Bryce. Well, I guess I guess I've just been doing this. Uh, Y'all are students are predictable. <laughs> They're highly addictive, and they build up tolerance very quickly. They do. How do they work? Under the world. Depressant. What was that? What'd you say? They are a depressant. They work in the brain. They depress the brain function. So they bind to receptors. And that's what causes respiratory depression and neural uh, depression. Not in a psychological depression, but in a physiologic neural, depresses neural function. So binds to the opioid receptors. All right, morphine and fentanyl, both of these are the most common ones we're going to see pre-hospital. Morphine is a derivative of um, the opium plant, the opium poppy, um, <clears throat> which incidentally is almost exclusively grown in Afghanistan um, in some parts of pa Pakistan and such like that. But that area of Asia is where opium is grown. And then heroin is a derivative of morphine that has been uh, refined a little bit. Fentanyl is a synthetic version that is more potent in that it takes less medication to cause an effect, but it's more specific to the opioid receptors that reduce, um, 
reduce pain perception without having the effects on the heart and on the blood pressure that like morphine would. And of course, we should be fairly familiar with the function of Narcan and how it blocks the effects of um, opio uh, opioids, opiates and opioids. All right, uh, these are other forms of antagonists. Um, That'll work on the brain, so preventing seizures, so dilantin. Um, they will block the opioid uh, receptors and prevent the seizure activities and things like that. Uh, we're gonna see these for our chronic seizure patients. Uh, histamine two, now histamine two is not the same as histamine one. Histamine one is gonna be Benadryl, these are your major allergic reactions. Histamine two receptors are predominantly found in the stomach and reduce or, and stimulate the production of stomach acids. Well, a, you know, Zantac, Ranitidine, these uh, medications right here that you can see, Pepsid, Tegament. Well, you will sometimes see doctors use histamine two blockers with uh, along with Benadryl and epinephrine for treating anaphylaxis because histamine 2 blockers, while they're predominantly in the GI tract, they are not exclusively in the GI tract. And so um, uh, so anyway, yeah. All right, I talked about uh, fenugrin earlier. Compazine is another one. I think compazine we're gonna start seeing more, especially now that Zofran is starting to catch flack. Zofran was never intended to be a broad, a broad spectrum antiemetic. It was specifically designed to treat the nausea caused by chemotherapy, by um, binding to the receptors in the brain that were affected by the chemotherapeutic treatments, by the cancer treatment drugs, and reversing those effects. It never was intended to be used for every person that has nausea. It is has some effects, but I think we will um, start to see compazine being more commonly prescribed. We're definitely, I'm definitely seeing compazine more common amongst uh, pregnant women with for treatment of morning sickness and um, hyperemesis gravidium. All right, uh, so this is somatostatin, which is released by our, our um, pancreas, just like insulin and glucose are. And it'll stop the production of these. Not what we're gonna need in the pre-hospital. Moving on, don't worry about it. All right, Tylenol, I talked about Tylenol earlier. Um, frankly, yeah, I talked about it earlier. I don't really see the need for it. I honestly don't see its function in pre-hospital EMS. I don't think that that is our role. In community EMS or community paramedicine, absolutely it has a role. But in pre-hospital, we are gonna be at the hospital before it works and it's not like a steroid that is life-changing or uh, prevents a life-threatening event um, like solumedrol would for an asthma or COPD patient. Calcium is, these are these are just some various um, electrolytes that we're going to see in the pre-hospital environment. So uh, if your patient's overdosed on calcium channel blockers, you give them a calcium, calcium chloride or calcium glutinate. Calcium glutinate is a more effective form of calcium. It's more easily used by the body. Calcium chloride is cheaper to make, cheaper to buy, and cheaper to store. So that's why we get calcium chloride. So it will burn, 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 burn if you're doing through uh, an IV. You want to have that as dilute as you can get it. Um, and for that reason, it's same reason, don't do as sub Q or IM. It needs to be dilute and do not let that vein um, blow. <coughs> Excuse me. This is just sugar water or as we like to call it here in the South, sweet tea. There's our diphenhydramine, Benadryl, I keep talking about histamine one blockers. 
And there's glucagon. Glucagon is the hormone that's normally produced by our pancreas and can be um, to reduce glycogen stores from the liver. Well, in the body, it can work in the liver and in the skeletal muscles. Well, we can give it uh, exogenously, you know, as an IM injection, and it'll function in the liver. It'll uh, convert the gl glucose stores in the liver into, um, excuse me, it'll convert the glycogen stores in the liver into glucose. All right, ketolorac, uh, toradol. So NSAIDs, I think I think we should have these more often. I think there's a lot of times that I could treat pain with uh, toradol that I'm reluctant to treat with a opiate. I don't really like feeding the opiate crisis. Uh, mag sulfate, again, another electrolyte. It's a smooth muscle relaxer. So while it technically is functions with or against most of the electrolytes in our body while you like to i like to explain it as uh well potassium excuse me calcium causes increased muscle contraction magnesium is going to decrease the muscle it's smooth smooth muscle relaxer smoothest smooth things out uh weaker muscle function relaxes the airways things like that and we talked about sodium bicarb the other day uh, a little bit. This is, you know, bicarb, but it's mixed with sodium, so it's in solution, can go into the body, and then the bicarb will bind to hydrogen, carbonic acid, that whole process. We went into that, I think, a lot. Um, so vitamin B1, mentioned that before. We don't normally see it any, we don't often deal with it anymore. Does anybody carry it? I know we got a few different zones. Uh, do you guys carry it, GTR, thymine, vitamin B1? Is that a thumbs up? Looks like it. All right, good deal. So yeah, um, the intention of vitamin B1 is to, well, vitamin B1 is a, medic, is a uh, coenzyme that is necessary in the production of ATP in the mitochondria. Without it, you can't get the electron transport train that we're used to thinking of. So, and you can't get the, excuse me, you can't get the glycolysis that we're used to thinking of. So when you have a patient who is nutrient deficient, they are not receiving the vitamins that they need and they're deficient on um, vitamin B1, glucose will build up in their cells and not be converted into ATP. So they will act like they're hypoglycemic even though their blood sugar probably is okay or their blood sugar will appear abnormally low because it's all shifted into the cells but the cells can't use it due to a lack of thymine. Um, Thymine is synthesized in the liver, so when a patient has liver damage, they're less likely to get it so uh, or absorb it properly, and so it has to be injected then. This is why chronic alcoholics, and we're not talking about your college student Thursday night drinker, we're talking about your stereotypical um, homeless skid row, all they drink is alcohol and maybe some potato chips and their alcohol is clear. They're not drinking beers and malt liquors and stuff. They're drinking hard, you know, like whatever the cheapest, nastiest gin or vodka they can get. They are consuming, and the reason I make that distinction is frankly, if you were to drink a lot of beer, especially if you have any form of taste and you drink real beer like an a lager or an ale or, you know, a stout, um, you're going to get nutrients. You could literally live on Guinness. Like it is, it, there is a lot of nutrient in there, but I wouldn't recommend it. Now, do what? Oh, I needed it here. Well, I mean, the Irish were doing it for years. I mean, that's what they, that was, that was like, oh, you, you need your afternoon snack? Here's a Guinness. You're like, oh, you're off the bottle, kid. Here's a Guinness. So, um, Water? Well, they couldn't drink the water. You know, the, the the Brits had all peed in it. So, um, when you have this chronic alcoholic who drinks clear alcohols and doesn't ingest a lot of other nutrients, they're deficient in thymine. The out the um, glucose is sequestered into the cells. Fluid is shifted into the cells with it, causing the cells to swell, swelling their brain because it's all cells, not just muscle and skin cells. So it works in the brain too, swells their brain, causing encephalopathy. We call this Wernicke's encephalopathy because of it's specifically caused by the deficiency of thymine. So for that patient, if you find them 
unresponsive or hypoglycemic, you have to give them the thiamine injection first in order to utilize the glucose that they have. Otherwise, you're just going to make their condition worse. If you inject a bunch more D10 or D50, whichever you use, you're just going to cause more sequestering, more fluid shifting, and further altered mental status. So you start with a thiamine injection so they can use what they've got. So it's not the average everyday person who got drunk at the bar alcoholics we're talking about we're talking about the people who are just that's all they that's the only intake they have is clear alcohols so that is that let's take a break and then i'll get into some ivs we're going to start chapter 14 and start talking about some of the dangers and things related to ivs Thank you. 